I think that's everybody, George. Okay, great. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Northampton public hearing held by the planning board twice a month. Uh, this is October 14th. We're meeting by Zoom, and everybody realizes this session is being recorded, okay? Um, we're going to start before we get into our agenda items, the applications for public hearing. We're just going to start with a public comment. If there's anybody in the audience who'd like to speak to the planning board about any items that don't relate to the agenda items, the public hearings coming up, um, please feel free to come to the podium, such as waving your hand or raising your hand via the toolbar. Okay, as is usual, nobody has too many things for the planning board, so we'll move right into our first item, which is a seven o'clock uh, public hearing for site plan and a special permit for Sayre Driveway and Flag Lot by Jeff Mackler at 415 North Farms Road, Florence Map ID 714. So the board will actually vote on two applications here, a site plan for the flag lot, I believe, and a special permit for the shared driveway. So does the applicant have a presentation for the planning board? Yeah, I have a brief presentation. I don't know if I'm allowed to share the screen or not. Yes, you should be able to share the screen. Okay. Everybody see that okay? Yes. Uh, so uh, we're here this evening uh, for a proposed shared driveway and flag lot um, at 415 North Farms Road in Florence. Um, the applicants are Jeff Mackler and Melanie Mendoza. The owner is uh, Frederick and Susan Mackler. Um, before you guys uh, for, <clears throat> for review, um, as a permit application, we have a site plan and special permit as was said. Um, some supporting documents, drainage letter, and some plans. Um, so the project is, uh, it's an existing lot. It's uh, 29, a little over 29 acres located on the, in the north part of town um, near the border with Williamsburg and, and Hatfield. Um, the existing parcel is if you can follow my hand here, it's this, this large parcel here. It's got frontage in two spots, one to the south and one to the north. Um, currently, there's a driveway on the north side with an existing home, um, and then there's uh, basically, you know, vacant land uh, to the south and west. Um, this is sort of a hayfield pasture area. Uh, this home um, is on public water and private septic, um, and there is utilities uh, on site down to the existing residence. Um, grades here, um, so North Farms Road is to our uh, west, and the, the parcel is located to the east. Um, grades basically um, come from either direction down to sort of a low point in the center where there is an, uh, an existing stream and wetland. So due to the city's wetland bylaw, we were encouraged to um, come up with an alternative uh, to coming across and creating a lot on the southern frontage. So we submitted a zoning permit and um, it came back with us needing a permit for a driveway and a flag lot. So the proposal here to create the parcel is to create a flag lot on the existing, for the existing residents, and then a conventional lot um, with frontage to the south for the new home. The existing driveway is then uh, proposed to become shared with a little spur off to get to the house at this location. Um, what's the goal here? Well, the goal is to build a single family residence. Um, this uh, kind of a custom designed uh, contemporary feel. Um, it's got uh, uh, solar, you know, it's maximized for solar gain. Um, and it was designed specifically for the site to, to fit into the 
uh, the grades on site um, and to provide uh, sort of a, a walkout structure uh, to avoid um, you know, moving lots of earth. So in order to accomplish this, um, if we are able to secure the permit from, from you folks, we'll have to come back with an a &R plan uh, to create the lot. This is a draft of the a &R plan. Like I said, um, if we're successful in getting the permit, we would come back to you for signature on this. Um, but as you can see here, um, we're sort of, I'm just showing the eastern, uh, see the western part of the lot. And here is the existing residence. So again, we're gonna create a flag lot here. This is the 25 acre portion. Um, it would have the existing residence on it. And then we would create this lot here, which is a conventional lot in order to be able to put the home here. We're proposing to use and make the existing driveway shared and common uh, to allow access. Um, as far as the site here, we're proposing to meet all zoning. Um, you know, we have in excess of the frontage here. Our, la our flag stem is, is correct. Um, we have our uh, one and a half time uh, frontage diameter here with the house in it. We have our 175 feet of frontage and our lot width back to our residence here. So we're not, not proposing any, any variances um, for that. Um, again, um, the lot here, just to go back, it's, it's actually in two districts, but all of our work and all of the proposed work is in the WSP district here. Uh, basically the remaining land is in that SC district. This is sort of a bird's eye view. This is um, looking west. Um, in the background here is uh, North Farms Road. Um, in the front here is the existing residence that exists. That's the residence that's going to become the flag lot. And then um, we're going to use the portion of the driveway and, and sneak our way in here to this area, approximately where the home would be located. This is sort of the hill, um, a little bit of kind of scrub vegetation there. There isn't a lot of clearing proposed here, very minimal. This is uh, just kind of an overall plot plan of where the work is. Um, all our work is proposed outside the buffer and it's basically limited to the northwest portion of the lot in this area. Next plan here, we're gonna zoom in a little bit here. Um, so this is the existing driveway that we're gonna reuse and then we're gonna build off of that driveway, a short section here um, to the residence, which would be located here. So this is the portion that would be shared. And this is the portion that would just be for the new home. Um, also here, we can see that we're proposing a well, uh, we're proposing to reuse uh, a shed that used to be um, part of the previous lot or the existing lot. And you can see uh, the septic system down here and that we're outside of the buffer and riverfront areas um, on the west side of the lot. Um, we have some proposed uh, drainage features, uh, swales with level spreaders, uh, turnouts and a drop inlet to um, control the stormwater. Um, we also have a long swale here uh, because this is, this is a sort of a, a sloping hill here. So we're grabbing any water from um, to the west of us and sending it around uh, the septic system into the field. This is a photo of the existing um, um, driveway. Uh, it's like a chip, uh, chip seal, sort of oil and stone. Um, it's got existing swales. Um, we're proposing to, to basically do the same thing. And, um, uh, with our extension here and add a few features here to improve. Um, down by this pole here is where the driveway would, would, would pop off. Um, this is an example here, or this is the location here. This is looking south. 
Um, and as you can see, it, it's a uh, field for most of it. Um, the driveway would come in here down to where we locate the house in the back here. Um, as far as the, the new portion of the driveway, it's under 8%. Um, so it's not very steep. Uh, one of the reasons we were able to do that is um, that sort of custom home we talked about with the garage up top here and the walkout. Um, that allowed us to, uh, um, to keep the disturbance under an acre and also keep um, the cuts and fills down, which are all good things. As far as the site plan and special permit criteria, um, we believe that um, what's before you is, is um, worthy of a permit uh, because the common drive, their shared drive scenario here that we have actually minimizes curb cuts. Um, the shared driveway reduces the amount of clearing in the driveway length that would be otherwise required. Uh, because we're reusing an existing driveway, um, we're reducing impervious surfaces um, as compared to a conventional unshared access point. Um, we're located behind and down gradient of residences and we're able to remain uh, to uh, maintain the existing buffers to the east. Um, the home proposed uh, features uh, southern exposure and overhangs to maximize solar gain in the winter and provide shade to the structure in the summer. Um, we're able to get uh, a, a lot here with a home without any new subdivisions road or um, having a development that is uh, um, disturbing more than an acre of, of land disturbance. Um, and uh, lastly, we're, we're not seeking any zoning variances. This is uh, basically just a special permit to allow uh, the existing residents to be put on a flag lot and to allow the shared driveway as we've shown. Um, that's really all I have, if, unless you guys have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Moreno. Um, could you go back a little bit to the shared driveway and show us where the turnout is for two cars passing, how you're going to? Sure. Um, so, so if you can see here, um, there's a, we have a widened section area here where two cars can pass. We also have, because this driveway here is in a T-shaped, um, this provides a, an emergency vehicle turnaround, which we ran a template for. Um, we also have a turnaround down the end here. Um, so in this area here, we can pass vehicles. We also, um, in this area here, because we have the T-type intersection, you can see any cars coming down the road or coming from the bottom here to allow can them to you, pass. Mr. Moreno, can you magnify that sheet for us a little bit, expand that? Yeah, I'm trying here, but it's not cooperating. Oh, there we go. Um, let me get the next sheet here, hold on. So So your top left corner, there's the passing area. Yep. Pull out. So here's our passing area here, which is 20 feet. Um, we're widening the 15 feet where needed. We have our emergency turnaround. And again, um, you know, the driveway comes down here to the existing residents down to the right. So you got good visibility in both directions here for passing vehicles. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Uh, I have a question. I don't have any problem with it. I'm just uh, curious as to, I forget which is the lot one and which is lot two, uh, but the lot with the new house retains frontage on the north and the south. I'm just curious like why you, it just creates a very odd shaped lot, which I guess is fine. Um, Yes, well, up here, um, there's not enough frontage up here to have both the flag lot and the conventional. Um, so 
we they created a flag lot here and then the frontage for this is actually down here um and that provides a lot with back to the to the residents here what, what's the benefit of the frontage on the north side for that lot though like why uh, didn't nothing, you just give it all to the existing house well that, that's this is what they worked out between, okay that's fine <laughs> um, yeah I, uh this is okay. uh, sort of what the what the thinking was. Again, it's um, their prerogative. I was just wondering what the logic. Yeah, was. it it creates a little bit of a funny shape, but uh, there was a method to the madness there in the discussions between them. Um, remember here that it is kind of funny, but remember how big this parcel is. If I zoom, let me zoom in here. So the existing residents here. This is a huge parcel here in this field. So although it's kind of a funny shape, um, the house is kind of up in this corner. Um, my other question might be, I know as you go down to the bottom of the existing driveway, as it drops down to the house, I, I'm thinking that's probably at least a 10, 10 degree drop, perhaps more. Um, but I guess our shared driveway ends where the new driveway peels off to the new house. Is that correct? Yeah, the top part is flatter. It does get steeper down the bottom, but that's the portion that is unshared. So yes, you're correct. And I noticed that as you're leaving the driveway to go back onto North, uh, to North Farms Road, visibility isn't great, especially to the left. There's one of those mirrors up on a pole across the street. Um, yeah, that, that's true. Um, it isn't great, um, but um, to my knowledge, it's been working. Um, I'm not aware of, of issues there. Uh, the existing owners, are, they might be on the call. We could, we could ask them um, what, this, what the situation is further, but I'm not really adding a lot of trips here. So I, I believe it is a, a good use of, of the existing curb cut. All right. If, if there are no other questions from the board, we could open it up to the public and then come back to the presentation. So is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak in favor or um, has any comments about the application for this flag lot and shared driveway? Please raise your hand via Zoom or just wave it. Okay, Mr. Moreno, do you know if the applicant has spoken with any of the abutters regarding this project or how those discussions went? Um. I asked that. I, I believe they've had some discussions, not a lot. Um, from my knowledge, there wasn't a lot of, of um, back and forth. Um, they might be on the call here. Not sure if they're willing to, uh, to discuss yeah. that. We are on the call and we had initial conversations with all the neighbors when we wanted to come in from the other end, which was not possible, where people were concerned about a long driveway across the field. So there hasn't been any conversation since we've clearly not come in across the field. And so no neighbor has expressed anything and they're all aware of it. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'm sorry, would you just give us your name and uh, your address just for our record? Yes, Susan Mackler, 415 North Farms Road. Great, thanks Susan. All right, no other comment from the public. We'll throw the ball back to the planning board. Is there any, any more questions or any motion to close the public hearing at this point? I would move to close the public hearing. I second. Okay, so uh, Carolyn, just to be clear on our kind of protocols, even though these are two permits, a special permit and a site plan, we, they both come under one public hearing. We're just closing one public hearing, not two, correct? But we'll probably be taking two votes. 
Um, you don't necessarily, uh, so it is officially you're voting on two um, aspects. So two permits, one is a site plan for the shared driveway, the other is a special permit for the creation of a flag lot. Um, you can make a motion to approve both at once as a package. You don't have to take them separately um, and you don't need to close the hearing separately because you open them together. Okay, great. So the motion has been made and seconded to close the public hearing. Any discussion? All right, then because we're in a Zoom meeting, we need to take a voice vote and I'll, I'll start over on my left with uh, Krista. How do you vote? Yes. Yes, all right, Melissa? Yes. David? Yep. And Jana? Yes. Chris? Yes. And Corinne? Yes. Okay, and the chair votes yes, so it's unanimous that the public hearing is now closed, so. I vote yes. Oh, Sam, there you are. <laughs> That's that, cool. I, it's cool, Adam. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, so the public hearing has been closed. We can't ask any questions of the presenter. Are there any other questions or comments by the board? Or is there a motion to accept uh, or not the application? I, I would move to uh, approve the flag lot and um, shed driveway applications. Uh, is it, I have is a couple. It Sam, are you? Saying something? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, uh, is, is it possible, just in terms of expediency, to like approve like a an A and R so that like Carolyn can just sort of rubber stamp it when I so that they don't have to wait for that part of it? You can actually. You can, and I was going to suggest that you do that either now or at the end. You could. Um, approve um, or, or vote to also have the plans endorsed that are the plans that you see in front of you because you're taking this action to allow the special permit. You've done that in previous meetings, but it certainly would, even though the plans haven't officially been um, submitted, um, the layout will be the same because they'd otherwise have to come back for an amendment. So um, absolutely, you could do that. As, and that would be a separate vote. That wouldn't be lumped into this one, but you could certainly do it tonight. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to describe some of the DPW comments. I, I guess we probably should have, I, these got sent to the applicant. Um, and also you all saw the DPW comments. And then in my staff memo, I mentioned that there are um, the trees at the front of the property um, look to be public shade trees. So um, the applicant would have to work with the city's tree warden in um, establishing the appropriate tree protection under very specific um, statutory requirements for that. So I would, um, recommend that that be part of your conditions. Um, also, there was a comment, um, they are disturbing less than an acre um, as presented in the plan, so that doesn't trigger stormwater permit, but technically under the DPW um, um, review process, they want um, an application for a waiver. That's separate from the planning board, so you don't have to hold up your vote for that. But um, you might add that as a condition. Um, there's also, um, in order to meet the traffic mitigation requirements for the city, any additional incremental increase in trips generated by a project, um, no matter how small, um, require um, some form of mitigation. The applicant make, can make a payment in lieu of actual physical improvements, and that's a formula in the zoning at one, um, because it's far out, it's not connected on um, the city bike paths or sidewalks, then the, the districts further out, the mitigation is um, three thousand a one-time payment of $3,000 in lieu of making improvements for the one additional unit. Hello, hello. Um, I don't know if I can be heard. Um, I just am joining the conference right now, and um, I thought I'm Geraldine Misa, and I'm a 
property owner on 30 Coolidge Avenue. Gerald Dean, right behind. Good, uh, good, good evening. My name's George. I'm the chair of the committee. And which application? Hi. Which application are you are you interested in? I think she said Coolidge, so I'm not sure. But you you guys are not at that point right now. Right. So. Right. Can you hear us? Okay. I can't hear you. Well. Can you hear me? I'm sorry, my phone is uh, muting me. Can you yes. hear me now? Yes, okay, thank can. you. Uh, uh, I own the property at 30 Coolidge Avenue. Um, and uh, it's been in my family since uh, 1952. Okay, so I just one, got one minute. Could you okay. identify yourself again? Geraldine. So Geraldine, we're Nisa? not at that we're not at that part of our discussion yet. We're talking oh, about- Oh, you're not at, no. are you on 29 Sherman Avenue? No, that is coming up. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. It's like, it's like seven, it's 4.30, I'm in Oregon. So oh, it's okay. like 4.30, which is 7.30 your time in Hamp. Right, um, right. So what, what do coming, I do? <laughs> we'll be up to that Thank you. Geraldine. Just hang in, okay, hang okay. in a little while. Okay, that sounds great. I saw some people. I've got Zoom. I've never done Zoom before, and I just put it on my phone, and I'm using another phone to talk. So, Glad this is uh, beyond. Thank you very much. Okay, appreciate it. All right. <clears throat> so, Carolyn has mentioned, I think, four other four um, conditions for our application, and I I assume the uh, applicant got to see the comments from the DPW. And they're okay with them. Um, so I guess, David, we're checking in with you to see if it's okay if we add those to your motion. Uh, it's, it's fine with me. I guess it goes back to the question of whether those apply, whether I say it now or not. But sure, I'm happy to uh, include the DPW comments as qualifications for the approval, as well as the uh, payment of the traffic uh, mitigation fund. Great. All right, so the motion has been made with the four conditions outlined by Carolyn. Um, any other discussions? Is there a second to that motion? I'll second it. Okay, so that was Melissa. Okay, thanks. All right, hearing no other comments about the application, we'll go to a votes vote. Um, so we're, we're voting at this point on both the special permit and the site plan for the shared driveway and the flag lot. Um, David? Yes. Jana? Yes. And Corinne? Yes. Uh, Sam? Yes. I, I can't hear you very well, George. Melissa. I don't know if it's just me or not. Can everybody else hear the chair okay? You're definitely muffled. Ah. So we're at Melissa. You're okay in Oregon. You're okay in Oregon. Um, Krista. Yes. And where are we here? I think that's everybody. And George, I vote also. Chris, did we get you? No, and yes. Thank you. All right, so it's unanimous to approve both the special permit and the site plan at North Farms Road. Now, does someone want to make a motion about the ANR? I, I move to approve a, uh, I guess, provisional, what, what do you call it? What would you call this? A, the, the future ANR for. Uh, this property at the two properties at Whiting Farm Road. At uh, North Farms Road. Okay. North Farms Road. Thank you. Great. I, yeah, I think it's a recommendation, Sam, but we get it. It's an approval, too. So, For endorsement. Endorsement. Is there a second? Okay. Second. Then uh, gets the second this time. So the motion's been made and second to endorse the A&R on North Farms Road. Any discussion? 
the only thing I would say is, Caroline, I guess the applicant still has to provide you a separate packet for this yeah. A&R, for the mm -hmm. archives and, okay. Yep. I would say, is there any, uh, do we need to say anything like we endorse it for, you know, assuming it's qualitatively the same as what we've seen tonight? Um, that can't hurt, like belt and suspenders, <laughs> but okay, yes. Great. <laughs> Hey, thanks for that addition, David. So I'm sure the minutes will reflect that. Okay, any other discussion? All right, so uh, we'll go to a vote. Again, we'll start with you, David. Uh, yep. And Jenna? Yes. Corinne? Yes. And Sam? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Chris? Yes. Krista? Yes. And the chair votes yes also. So um, good work applicants, Mackler family, good luck on your project. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it is now um, 737 and we'll open up a public hearing for a <clears throat> site plan for demolition and construction by Severn Builders at five townhouse units, 29 Sherman Avenue, Northampton, map ID 25A-99. And uh, for the woman in Oregon and others who may be new to planning board, first the planning board hears a presentation by the applicant. The planning board then discusses and clarifies any points of the presentation then we open it up to the public for their comments. After the public has shared, we'll move back to the planning board for other clarifications. If we've heard enough, then we'll close the public hearing or decide to continue it to a further date for more information. So <clears throat> without further ado, does the applicant have a presentation of 29 Sherman? Uh, yes. Uh, good evening, my name is Christopher Carney. I work as a land surveyor and civil engineer over at our Lebec Associates. And tonight I'm happy to be here on behalf of Sovereign Builders and Todd Salura uh, to request major site plan approval for a project on 29 Sherman Avenue. This would be five residential townhouse units. I lived on Sherman Avenue until uh, April of last year. So I'm pretty familiar with this area. And I think I'll just jump right into it and start with the, the existing conditions and share my screen. Question. Could I ask a question? Um, I'm on the computer at Yes, Geraldine. You, George, you might repeat that um, questions from the public can come after um, the presentation and after the board has had a conversation. Did you get that, Oregon, Geraldine? Um, no, I didn't. I, I'm trying to do an unmute. Could you say it one more time, please? So the process is for the planning board that we get a presentation from the applicant. Yeah. And after right. the presentation, the planning board members ask some clarifying questions. And then, yeah. then we open it up to the public, the abutters for any comments they might have about the project. And then it goes yeah. back to the board again, okay? Yeah, yeah, I got that. I'm trying to look at the uh, website now with the plans, you know, what they put on, on the city website. So that's what my question was about. So I'm trying so to follow the, you the with your talk. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, would you proceed? Okay, um, as mentioned, we're here for a a residential development at 29 Sherman Ave for five residential units. Um, currently existing conditions on the property. Uh, there's an existing, I, I'd call it a multi-use building. It's a garage with additional accessory space. So a large footprint on this. And if we take a look uh, at where the site sits in Northampton, um, it's 29 Sherman Ave. And as we drop a person here on the street, uh, we can get a, a look at how the property currently looks. So 
as you can see, it is currently a, a garage, three overhead doors. And then off to the right-hand side of it, there's a, a loading dock. Not sure what that was used for. Uh, so the applicant proposes to demolish this and replace it with the five townhomes as mentioned. Uh, terrain on here is, it's, it's a pretty mildly sloped property. Generally the high point is over here on the west side of the property. And it's slightly higher over here to the east and to the north. And that's because this is an, a low point within the neighborhood. Uh, stormwater generally collects in this area to the northeast uh, of the property. And because of that collection and that ponding that was occurring, uh, the city of Northampton, I believe, put in a catch basin here within the property. So there's a drain line that runs from Sherman Ave to a catch basin here in the northeast of the property. And then that drainage line continues to Coolidge Ave. Uh, I've been in discussion with uh, engineering department and there's no formal easement on this drain line. It's been placed and I'm not sure how or when it was placed, but there's no legal rights from the city to maintain this drainage easement. So as part of this project, the applicant's going to be giving the city a 20 foot wide easement in order to maintain this drain line across their property. As you can imagine, a drain line like this, we wouldn't ever wanna put a building over it. And as 20 feet in width, it really limits uh, the way this property is being developed in the future because uh, we're not going to be placing a building over this area. But again, terrain is a bit higher all around the perimeter of it. And this would be an onsite low point. And this is the existing mixed use building, a gravel driveway uh, throughout the property. Generally, there are only two major trees here, a beech tree here and a beech tree here. You might have noticed on Google Earth that there was a maple tree here in the front that's been removed. Uh, so it's just those two major beech trees being the specimen trees on the site. Uh, there's some hedgerows to the northern side of the property. Uh, as part of the project, we're gonna try to uh, protect these trees as best as possible. They're very nice beech trees. I guess I'll admit EM into the... So the first step of the project would be demolition and removal. Uh, first, we would demolish the existing multi-use building. Then we'd start placing erosion control, or in conjunction with that, we would place erosion control at the site being an anti-tracking apron and a silt fence around the perimeter of the site. And that will help sediment uh, be contained on the site so it's not tracked into the road or spilled onto abutting properties. Uh, all the gravel areas within the site would also be removed. And as you can see, these trees would have protection and there would be some saw cuts within the road for utility connections. On, onto the next sheet, this would be the proposed layout for the site. There would be a single curb cut driveway. Instead of, primarily there really are two curb cuts on the site, they're gravel driveways, so they're not really formal curb cuts. And there is no curb on Sherman Ave on this site. But this would be an 18 foot wide driveway proposed to access these five residential units. Uh, the residential units are about 2,128 square feet in the living space. They're uh, about three stories tall. We'll look at the architecturals after uh, we go over the site plans. Also, as you can see, there's the 20 foot wide easement proposed on this property and the buildings being set outside of that 20 foot easement. Uh, the grading of the property will match the existing drainage patterns of the site. As mentioned before, there is a low point right here. And so uh, we'll, we're gonna maintain that pattern and keep stormwater flowing towards this low point. Uh, but a big benefit of this project to the city and all the neighbors is that we're gonna propose a bioretention area in this northerly corner of the property. And that'll help contain stormwater for not just this property, but for some neighboring properties. It'll fill up and then overflow into a beehive structure here and then flow into the catch basin. So this really gives uh, the site some added stormwater storage and it'll reduce the burden on city infrastructure so that uh, other storm events can be handled more appropriately without flooding. Continuing to the drain, uh, the, the utility plan. Um, 
We're proposing one catch basin here to collect stormwater, and it would end at a flare down section at the buyer retention area that I was discussing. Uh, utility connections would generally be run on the outside behind the building. That would be water, electric, and gas. I think gas currently is under a moratorium, but we're going to show it on these plans in case that changes. Sewer connections would come from the front and connect to the existing sanitary sewer line in Sherman Avenue. And we're gonna propose a doghouse manhole over the existing sanitary sewer line and connect to that. All the, the roof leaders for these buildings, some of them will be contained uh, within this subsurface drainage network. Other roof leaders will be allowed to drain on grade and flow naturally to this bioretention area. Uh, the landscaping plan, as mentioned before, these two beech trees, this one here and this one here, those specimen trees are being retained. Uh, two more beech trees are proposed at the entrance of the driveway. Uh, there's also white spruce trees and some rhododendrons proposed around the border of the site. And then the bioretention area is planted with wildlife, uh, uh, species with high wildlife characteristics to promote and give a a sanctuary to some birds and smaller mammals in the area. The next few sheets are detail sheets, which I think we can skip over, but they detail all the different structures placed at the site, as well as the bioretention area. I think a good place to head from here is the um, architectural plans. As you'll note on the layout sheet, this uh, building fronts mostly on Sherman Avenue. And while the, the doorway or the garage entry is on this side, and originally the front of this unit would have been on this side, you'll see that a sidewalk is proposed in order to enter the building on Sherman Avenue. And that's uh, as required by your regulations. Uh, so we can look at what a typical building would look like. This would be the unit in the middle of the site. So that would be units uh, three and four here. Uh, they would have a garage and an entry at the bottom layer, uh, and then two floors of living space and a gabled attic. Floor plans here, and these have been submitted as part of the uh, site plan set. And then the back of the building has some windows and a deck off the back, uh, as well as a basement access, basement slash garage access. Uh, the single unit, it's a slightly different, so but mostly the same. It's really a duplex cut in half. And where we come into the really customized design, and, and I want to thank Todd for preparing all these different architectural renderings for this project. I uh, usually will only have one, but uh, he was able to provide you with architectural details for all three buildings. Um, the third building being the one fronting on Sherman Ave would look from the front primarily the same, except for the doorway is no longer on the front of the unit on the left, unit one. And you can see the roof area here. And then you can see this uh, side of the house facing Sherman Avenue has been dressed up so that it, it maintains the character of the neighborhood and looks like a, a front entry to a building. Um, after submission, uh, we received some comments from DPW and the tree warden. Uh, I, to me, all of those comments were pretty minor and I don't think we'll have any problem satisfying all the conditions that DPW has requested. Uh, the tree warden had some comments about the species out there being red maple and beech. Uh, I think beech makes sense because it uh, mimics existing trees in the area. So I think that would be a good choice to retain. Uh, the red maples will definitely swap out as necessary. And really those beeches, if the tree warden would like them changed to a different species, we're willing to accommodate, of course. So I think at that point, that'll be conclude my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about this project. Thank you very much. Questions from the board, clarifications? Do we have a dumpster on site or some trash removal areas that we're, they're not seeing on here? No, no dumpster proposed as part of the project. Um, trash bins would be wheeled to the curb, um, the same as everyone in the neighborhood. Along those lines, any uh, special plans for snow removal? 
That was a comment from DPW and we will be able to provide snow removal. The appropriate place would be over this uh, drainage easement. It provides an area that will drain to the bioretention area uh, and be able to accommodate snow. Um, sometimes salts are used, uh, but as a condition of approvals, uh, it could be conditioned so that salts are not used in this area. That way snow can be stored here in the grass area and flow to the bioretention area without any worries. Uh, in the event of multiple storm events, snow would be trucked off site as necessary. I'd like to go, I'd like to go back to the trash. Removal. The trash is, it's not just like every other house because these are single family homes with, that don't have what would be all of, I'm told 10, 10, 10 huge containers of trash. So where would you put those? Why, would every there, why are there 10? Is it because of recycling? Well, because you have, recy you have recycling and trash. And if you have five units, that means you have 10 containers. Right. Sorry, I, let me introduce myself. Todd Solera, Sovereign Builders. I'm the owner of Sovereign Builders. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, that's just a lot of containers. So that's very different than your neighbors. Um, I, I, I guess this parcel has a, approximately I, I, almost three lots worth of frontage. The lot frontage requirements for a single family home would be 50 feet. I believe this project has about 130 feet of frontage. So if it was chopped up as an A and R and made it into single family residences, you would have three units on here and six trash receptacles. So this uh, project would really be four more trash bins than what is a by right use for this site. But, but wait, okay, but you're not doing it by right. So I'm asking, you, so you have to come to me and ask for, you're asking for something. So I'm asking you, where are you gonna put it? Correct, so they would be lined up at, at this point. What is being where? proposed? There's, I'm sorry, I've had a very long day. I'm sorry for yelling at you, but I, I but, you telling me it's my right after I ask you a very polite question is not, I'm, I'm past that point. So I'm what, what are we talking about? I'm, I apologize. Um, we have about a hundred and hundred feet of grass area here, as well as about uh, 25 to 30 feet of grass area here. I imagine these trash bins would be placed either in this hundred foot area or this 30 foot area. That's our current proposal. Are you just referring to on pickup day? You're not, they would be probably be stored in the garages, correct? Of course, of course they would be stored and not visible from the street all times except for trash pickup. Okay. okay. Thank you. I think that's what we were looking for as opposed to having them four on the side of each garage for the neighbors and for our site. So. Sam, if you want to propose that as a condition that trash containers are stored out of sight other than pickup day, you know, we could consider that. Thanks. Chris, okay, I mean, something? Yeah, of course. Uh, can I ask a couple questions, George? Yeah, I'm sorry, the wrong Chris responded. We have two Chris's here. Yeah, go ahead, Chris Tate. Okay, uh, uh, real quick, I was just curious what the, uh, the pretreatment is into that bioretention area from your, your catch great question. Yeah, great question. So this is a water quality unit, an inlet structure. Uh, okay. It's a barracuda water quality unit, but also with a catch basin grate. So that would be the first line of defense. And then the storm water would be further treated in the bioretention area. Okay. And then the only thing I was really worried about was that existing 28 inch beech tree, the, uh, the frontage tree. So it looks like you're proposing all of your underground utilities to go right through it. Um, so yeah. I'm wondering how you're going to keep it safe while you're also, um, you know, putting the water, the gas, the electrical through there. Yeah, um, uh, it, it will be difficult. Uh, these roots, you never know where the roots go and the drip line of the tree is pretty extensive. 
Uh, unfortunately, these plans, we can't overlay every sheet on top of each other. But while we're drafting, we have the ability to look at where the utilities are compared to the tree. Uh, and so we've done our best to route those utilities as far away from the tree as possible. And you'll, you'll Well, luckily you have the tree on the plan right there. Right it's there, that there dark circle. Right so we're, we're trying to keep the gas as far away from it here and the water, and you'll notice the separation here to allow for the tree. So underground electric is closer than we would like it to be to the tree. I mean, the, the gas is closer than I would like it to be from the tree as well. I, so, hear, yeah, that, I, I hear that beech trees have a pretty uh, robust root structure. Yeah, the gas connection right now, I mean, is very schematic. I think there is a gas moratorium in Northampton and these connections won't be made at this point. Uh, as part of the DPW comments, they had the water line. They, they made a recommendation that the water line be moved to the fronts of the units. That would give us uh, additional room in the back and possibly this uh, underground electric line could be swapped with the water line to give the tree a little bit more buffer. I think they also had a comment that um, they don't really allow underground electric and public right of ways, private True. electric services. So do you have any thoughts of where your electric pole is going to be on your site? And then, and then I assume you'll transition to underground electric on site? Absolutely. So we just got these comments today, so I can't say definitively where the utility pole would be placed, but this is the existing utility pole. It would make sense to place that utility pole in this general area, pretty much on the property line. That way those easement issues are uh, extinguished. Um, so probably overhead from this utility pole to a utility pole here, and then that would have the drop connection to underground electric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. It sounds to me like there's still some some things to work out with the utilities. I don't, I don't know how much that's in our purview or not, but I, it sounds well, like it's gonna be changing from what we, we see in front of us. I mean, I would just to um, clarify or jump in and, and add to um, your um, line of, of concern there, Chris, um, you know, the underground electrical, um, utilities would be um, potentially have a, a, a significant impact to that tree. And so that whole review process is going to be dictated by the tree wardens. So it, it may, in fact, be they can't put the electrical utilities underground there, given that the, com the other comments about potentially National Grid and DPW not wanting um, underground to go, you know, from the other side of the road and that they'd have to plant a pole anyway, they could probably put it anywhere. I mean, this is an opportunity to put it in a different place that doesn't affect that beech tree. So either right on the corner of the property or maybe even on the other side, there's another overhead that currently comes across. So, you know, there could be other locations, but I think that's important for you all to consider in terms of whether or not you condition it that it can't be in the location they're showing because of the impact to the tree or that you may want to see a revised plan before you you know finally close the hearing so it's up, up to you all to sort of think that through thank you i do think swapping the underground electric with the water line and moving the water line to the front will help a lot of these problems we could place the power pole Right here at the corner, as Carolyn had suggested, and put a drop connection that would run generally parallel uh, with the property line and um, substantially far away from the existing tree. But of course, we'd work with the tree warden to make sure that's uh, appropriate. Just as a design consideration, the reason we kept the water here instead of, uh, instead of in front is because we have a sanitary sewer line in front. And we're always trying to keep water and sanitary sewer separate. And in terms of the gas line, I think Northampton and many communities are trying to um, help developers move away from providing gas connections, stable gas connections like that. So we might think about eliminating that gas line from the project and moving to something else. I'll leave that for you and the developer to figure out what that does in terms of attractability for the units. Um, if there are any other questions from the board we might move into the public comment for a few minutes okay 
So now, now is the opportunity for folks um, to speak um, regarding the application. Um, please either raise your hand uh, electronically uh, using the toolbar or wave it, or people on telephones, I believe it's a, a star or pound nine feature. Okay, very good. I see uh, Martha Schulman. And just Hi, identify you. yourself and your address for us, please. Sure. Um, this is Mara Schulman. I'm at 27 Coolidge Avenue. Um, please tell me, just indicate you can hear me. I'm at Sun's Gymnastics class, so there's a little bit of background noise. Can you hear me okay? We hear you and your children pretty well. So I'm sorry. You're going back into the main room in a second. You should, you should settle down. So I have four issues I just want to Hi, raise. Mara. Um, Hi, Mara. I can hear you. Okay, so I have four, four considerations that I wanted to raise. Um, the first is that ever since the construction occurred with the rotary um, and the two streets north of Coolidge are now not um, as accessible from Route 9, there's been a lot of increased traffic on Coolidge Avenue and Sherman because the people who live in the neighborhoods north of us are using those two roads to get to their homes now. Um, not a problem, happy to have my neighbors use the roads. However, that increased traffic, and I think the fact that people don't live on the roads that they're traversing has caused people to drive faster on Coolidge and Sherman. And I know this because I'm in the street a lot with my children and I walk my dogs a lot. And so I think it's gonna be really important to add speed bumps to Sherman and Coolidge if we're talking about increasing the traffic more with you know five additional units means probably 10 additional cars. Um, so I wanna, make sure that this is on the radar of um, the planning board because it's already a problem even without these five additional units. Um, the second point I wanted to bring up was, I understand there's a gas moratorium in, and it seems unlikely that we're gonna be increasing gas you know, availability in the future due to Northampton's commitment to decreasing greenhouse gases and sustainability. So what kinds of requirements are you asking for new construction Construction in terms of it being green and sustainable, because I didn't hear the presenter the, talking about in any way how his construction is different than past construction. And a new unit just went up on Sherman recently, and I don't know, you know, what how it was built, what kind of sustainability it it, um, it takes into consideration. But I don't see any solar panels on it, um, so I'm guessing traditional construction is not taking into consideration Northampton's very deep commitment to reducing our impact on climate change. And so I, I have a hard time understanding how any new construction cannot be made um, with maximum sustainability measures. So that was my second point. Um, my third point is that these units that were described are really different than the existing units and buildings in our neighborhood. Most of our houses are capes ranches and we have a couple of two store we have some two-story houses with attics um most of the houses are smaller my house and i've lived in this neighborhood for 16 years i moved in when my son was a newborn and now he's 16. my house is 1200 square feet it is plenty of space for me and two kids so i don't understand why new construction is being proposed townhouses are being proposed a, th a thousand square feet larger than mine and and two stories taller than mine i mean we are getting to the point in our in our society where we need to consume less. So why are we talking about building houses that are two stories higher and a thousand square feet bigger than the other houses in this neighborhood? If we can live here comfortably with that amount of space, then I'm sure new residents can as well. Um, and I also don't, I mean, I'm not adjacent to this property, so it isn't personally going to affect me, but the people who are adjacent aren't gonna wanna have buildings adjacent to their homes that are two stories taller than theirs. I mean, this is a this is a residential neighborhood, not a city. So they shouldn't have buildings that are towering over their homes. And then my final um, concern, this is probably the concern that I'm most, the, the biggest concern for me. Um, you know, the housing market in Northampton is outrageous right now. It's so expensive. My house itself has increased over $100,000 in value since I bought it, probably more. I'm not interested in selling, so I haven't really had it appraised. And you might think, congratulations to me, I have more assets. 
I think this is dismal. I think this is terrible news because that means that unless you are solidly middle class, you cannot afford to buy a home in Northampton. And we've become a really exclusive community. It's not inclusive. It's not accessible. It's not welcoming of people who um, don't have economic um, privileges. And that's not the kind of community that I want to live in. It's, it feels very exclusive. And I would like to a commitment that new construction, at least a certain percentage of it, be dedicated to affordable housing. So I don't know, are these townhouses going to be sold at market value? In which case, a house, a new building on Sherman just went for like over $450,000. I mean, that is well over what the existing houses are, are valued at. So if these townhouses are likely to sell for that amount too, which means we're going to have people coming into our neighborhood that are hugely privileged. And, you know, is, is that what we want to be as a community, a community that only attracts and welcomes people who have economic privilege? I, I really, I'm, I'm embarrassed by that. I just went to a meeting last week where our town, I'll be, I'll finish in one second, but our town adopted a resolution to raise the minimum wage for farm workers. And I attended that hearing. And I was so proud of the decision makers in my town for doing that. If this, if our town is, if our city is not willing to commit to affordable housing, we're going in the opposite direction. And I guess I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. And we'll try to respond to your points as the meeting goes on. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> the next speaker up at the podium would be Victoria Monroe. Your address, please. I'm at 38 Coolidge Avenue. I am right in back of all this construction. I think I'm the closest um, one to it as far as what my footage is and what I'm going to be looking out my window. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things and ask a couple of questions. One is, you know, my backyard is very quiet. There's no one around. It's very private. And I even have bushes up between my property and the property behind, mostly because I've been looking at that ugly building for 20 years um, and it's, it's not pretty. <laughs> so we put up some bushes, but now these buildings, I'm, I was really shocked to hear they're gonna be three stories high plus an attic. And so this is going to be what I look out of my backyard at. Um, so I'm really not happy about that. Um, I'm certainly not happy that all this construction is going to be happening. Um, I have a couple of questions. So I'll just say them and if they get answered um, right away or later, that's fine. Um, in one of the pictures, there's a line of bushes along the um, border, but then they for some reason stop where my property is. Um, so I'm curious why. Um, and I would like them to be there. So it's another layer of um, privacy for us. Um, I'm wondering when this construction might happen. Um, and what else did I have here? If there, it didn't look like there was any plan for any type of fence or anything on there. And I also wanted to just really back up Mara in everything that she was saying. I really appreciate her um, bringing those things forward. And that's my opinion. And that's all. Thanks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Anyone else? Uh, I think this is our friend Geraldine in Oregon, 2086. You can unmute, unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello. Okay, hi, my phone, when I unmuted it, it went back on mute. Hello, uh, my neighbor, ladies. Um, I'm at 30 Coolidge, it's the plan with the hedgerows there. And I think that might answer Victoria's question. I don't know where, if um, the uh, hedgerow is, that's our, uh, our family property since 1952. And I'm really distressed over this, um, in fact, it like makes me tear up because it's, um, as the ladies have said, it's been a family neighborhood for all kinds of people and, you know, capes 
and a couple of houses that were a couple of stories, but we're single family, you know, one level with a basement, a first level and an attic. That's the height. And it'll be three stories. I mean, that that's unacceptable, totally unacceptable to me. And I think the other people, too. I'm really going to start crying because this is very upsetting to me. And the gentleman said that by city, how big of a square foot square foot area is what I I'm asking about this plan? I don't know the actual size, you know, of the square footage because um, I knew the Archambos since I was born. They were there a long time, and the, I see this was bought for two hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, knew the them and the and Paul, the son that was there. So I'm really tearing about this um, thing. I just got noticed today, and this is very upsetting. Um, I'm upset that there's this um, huge structure there. I'm upset that there's five squished in, you know, maximum. If you went by normal codes, it would be three, but you're putting in five. And I'm also concerned about the bioswill that you're proposing and how that's going to be in the snow. I mean, we lost a maple tree. I'm losing a maple tree in the front because of salt and stuff like that. So for you to jump the snow in the back of our, you know, on the back line of our properties, Victoria and mine or somewhere in there is just unacceptable. And and I'm just, I got to breathe a minute because this is just too much. Um, I wonder if the houses are going to have a basement. I, I, I am against the three stories. You know, that's just not acceptable. And against the townhouse idea, you know, if you want to put three houses in there, maybe four in in terms of a townhouse, but not five. I mean, I think that's greedy. And, and if it needs to go with the city concerns, I just am so upset. So <laughs> I'm concerned about the electrical. And, and in terms of gas uses, I'm very, you know, I was um, recycling since, you know, forever my de- you know and um uh, winter in new england is horrible you know we had an oil furnace and the oil deliveries didn't come because of the snow when i was a child my father got mad called a um, gas company and connected to gas and you know if the electric goes out if your oil goes out gas lines are still there to keep people warm in winter you know for children for babies for seniors for everybody you know so I- i'm not against gas i am actually know that it saved our family, you know, that winter when it was like, you know, sub, sub zero winter. So I have a concern about the gravel. Um, is it gravel? Just the whole kind of layout with the gravel, with the bio swill um, and the underground electric and that, that flooding area. I'm the property that has, a, you talked about a 20 foot easement. I'm really concerned about all of that major impact on our, on our homes and safety so the um, there's a drain there in the corner of my property, my parents' property, where the um, sheds are in there. There's a drain ditch, and I didn't understand the man's um, understand the man's talk about that. But that's a big thing. Um, Victoria's property, when I was growing up, used to flood. They had a sump pump in there. You know, our property didn't have that at 30 um, Coolidge. So drain. You know, I'm just I'm concerned about that as well. And then in terms of the price of the houses, where are they going to be pitched at to be sold? That was something that was mentioned as well with, you know, affordability, how much of a value and what's the selling, you know, pre-sale price going to be for people? Are they going to get a special buy with a floor model? I, I just don't like it. And um, it, so I've got like, I don't know, 12 points at least down that I'm questioning. And uh, I guess that's about everything for now. Thank you very much, Geraldine. Anyone else care to comment on the project? Hi, George. Um, I would. Can you hear me? Yes. Could you give us your name and your address, please? Uh, my name is Bob Perry. I live at 15 Sherman Ave, right next door. Um, I'd like to give Christopher a little education. That was potato storage. Anybody that lived on Sherman Ave would know that. Um, so. <clears throat> I don't feel like I'm going to be able to do anything to stop it. Uh, I think the Northampton government, the planning board, and the zoning board should be ashamed of themselves. It's 29 Sherman Ave. 29 is one number. <clears throat> so here's some stuff. Um, the beech tree, the 36-inch beech tree, had a power line run through it. It's hurt. It's a beautiful beech tree. It severely needs to be trimmed. I've been picking up fallen branches for 35 years. 
Um, I've always taken them away or burned them. Now I just pile them up on the other side. Um, <clears throat> on my wife's and I property, we have a cherry tree that we planted 25 years ago. Um, it's pretty close to the uh, property boundary. I'd like some kind of insurance that that tree is going to come out of this 100% safe. Um, <clears throat> Christopher talked about planting a bunch of trees. There were, what, 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 what were they, Christopher? Christopher Carney? Beech I trees? Bob, Bob. I'm not supposed to respond directly to your comments. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you remember, George? Yeah, they're beech trees. That's what they proposed, beech trees and some uh, pines, some evergreen. Yeah, so those evergreens I would like to not see. Um, I have apple trees and we have apple seed or rust already in the neighborhood and we just don't need it anymore. Um, and, uh, and I don't wanna see speed pumps. I want people to be mature and drive a speed limit. Um, I have a car that does not handle speed pumps well. Thanks, Bob. Bob, before you leave me, leave us, can you describe your house to us? Uh, my house is uh, two floors with a basement and an attic. Uh, it's the old original farmhouse. Um, it's the house that used to be owned by the same people as the potato storage. Um, it was built in 1910. Thank you. Just want to make sure that not all the houses in the neighborhood are small ranch homes. No, no, just the bulk of them. Okay, good. Which side of this, which side of the development is your house on? If you're looking at the development, are you on the right or the left? The right. Thank you. Yeah, that's my garage in the drawings. <clears throat> Okay. You, you bought the Parsons house? Did you buy the Parsons house, Bob? Great. Yes. The yes. farmhouse? Yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm Geraldine Nisa. Yeah. We're we're an old neighborhood, you know, and we're this is just despicable. I'm sorry. Mrs. Parsons used to plant lilacs there and where that potato shed was, there <clears> were <throat> lilacs that I stole from her for years. Yeah. You know, so you've yep. got a history here and people that love this community. And you coming in and buying the Archambos plot for two hundred thousand and developing this yeah. big conglomeration yeah, is just yeah. not good. I'm yeah, sorry. I mean, I'll I'm shut up. <laughs> okay. I love Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who'd like to make a comment, either for or in opposition to the application? Okay, all right, hearing none, I think we'll turn it back to the board for questions and discussion. Um, I could start maybe with a few of the questions that were raised by the abutters and I would ask either Mr. Salura or Christopher Carney to respond to them. One is, uh, you know, the city is looking at how we get to net zero with new construction. Um, maybe you could explain a little bit about what kind of construction techniques and materials we'll be using on these houses. Sure, these these are they're, they're all they'll all be code compliant, and they'll they'll they have to comply with the latest energy code. They're they're I'm proposing to use heat pumps as the source of heating. We do like to use gas for hot water and most people like to cook with gas. So mo modulating flame gas, hot water heaters are very efficient. They're not storing any hot water. There's an, it's an on-demand type of hot water. So it's very efficient. And so if gas is available, that would certainly be a desired resource for util utility for the structures. The building heights, some questions were asked of all, the buildings would not, they'll be in compliance with code. They will not exceed, you know, the 35 foot, which is allowed by the building code. Um, they're 1400 square feet. They're not, so I'm not sure where, you know, was asked that you know, or stated that they were a thousand greater than 1200. They're, they're 1400 square feet each unit is. Um, so sorry, I, I answered more than your one question. And they're... That's okay. 
Um, if things go well, Mr. Salora, when would you anticipate that construction would begin? It's it's very it's tough to tell, to be honest with you. So um, uh, it would be certainly within the time frame of the expiration of the permit. I guess greater than that, or you know, more more accurate than that, it's hard for me to say right now because of many things, and one of which being supply chain and cost of materials. And I think the market is changing a little bit, uh, so um, within within the time frame, hopefully next spring is my, that's that's my hope is next spring, but certainly before the permit runs out. And I don't really know what 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 length of time is typically allowed for this uh, permit. Thank you. Right, just to be clear, the fourteen hundred square foot is the footprint, not the size of the unit. I guess I should clarify that. And I think no, the raw numbers came from me. So let me uh, share my screen again, and we can go over the square footage exactly and the heights as well. <clears throat> uh, so as shown on the plan, the footprint of each unit is seven hundred square feet. There's three story units, so there's twenty one hundred uh, square feet of space within the unit, but only the upper two floors are living space. So as Todd mentioned, there's 1,400 square feet of living space. That's confirmed on these uh, plans, which show a garage area that is completely um, used for simply vehicle storage. Uh, as far as the heights go, um, the height is measured as required and recommended by zoning bylaws and that's to the middle of the gable of the roof. These are 10 uh, foot stories, which is a little smaller than many of the houses in the neighborhood. And when standing out front of the house, I believe we had Bob who was a neighbor, neighbor next door over here in this house. Uh, so the height of this house um, is probably about 28 to 30 feet. And then as we move down the street this way, we're gonna notice that some of the houses are single story ranches, but uh, some of the houses are not single story ranches. Thank you. Could, uh, could you speak to the uh, plantings that go along the rear lot line that separates the project from the abutters? Absolutely. Um, looking at these plans, there's always some confusion looking at plans like this, uh, they're pretty complicated. So we're gonna look at this um, planting plan and you'll see the white spruces here, right? And then a gap in between the white spruces as, as noted before. The reason for that gap is there's an existing arborvitae hedgerow in this area. So we're just gonna maintain the existing shrubs that are on the applicant's property and then uh, supplement them with the white spruce trees. These trees, some of them were placed near the drain line and the DPW had a comment to have these spruces moved at least 10 feet away from the subsurface drainage line. So this spruce tree and this spruce tree likely will get moved uh, left and right. As far as the bioretention area, I know there were some comments about that. This is gonna be a, a big improvement to uh, the neighborhood. Uh, the way this structure will work is that all the water from the neighborhood will collect in this, uh, I'll call it a ponding area, right? It's planted with uh, species that are, have high wildlife characteristics and it will be primarily dry. But then in storm events, it'll fill up. And the way it fills up is, is shown on this detail here where um, there's a, it'll pond up here. There's underground drainage lines that'll help the water enter the ground. But then once it hits a certain elevation, it'll overtop into this structure and then spill into the catch basin that is currently being used. So really in most storm events, and I, I can go through the drainage calculations, but for the, the two year storm event, for instance, this uh, puddle will not reach the overflow elevation and will not even hit the city infrastructure. That's a big benefit for the city. Uh, currently, water just flows into that catch basin untreated. It has sediments within it and it enters the city's uh, infrastructure. After this project, much of the neighborhood will uh, enter this ponding area and never discharge into the city infrastructure. Thank you. Um, Victoria Monroe. 
Hi, I just, I wanted to comment on the um, Arbor Vitae that was mentioned. So we, uh, as of last year, were considering taking those down and trying to replace them uh, and decided we can't afford it, but they are really getting old. And I would request that we not rely on them being there, but I think that those trees should continue all the way to give us more privacy, especially since this is like, you know, very, very close to our yard. And right at the edge is where we have our screen house and shed, which is on your plans. The screen house is not, but the shed is. And that's where we spend most of our summer. So um, I would appreciate that if possible. Would the applicant be willing to take that into consideration, bearing the responsibility of removing the old Arba Vita and planting new ones? I think it's 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 reasonable. Sure, of course, we want to get along in the neighborhood, and uh, that's. Uh, I think we we'd be happy to look at that and work with you on that. Thank you. Just real quickly around the comment about speed bumps and traffic, um, the planning board unfortunately can't drill down to that level of detail too much. That is something that you can bring up with your city councilor, your Ward 3 councilor, who's also a member of the Transportation Committee, and they can look at those streets and decide if kind of the level of service demands that kind of mitigation of speed bumps or stop signs or, you know, any kind of other traffic signage. But um, unfortunately, that's out of our purview for this type of arrangement. We're just want to make sure that there's parking on site for cars and that the amount of traffic that adds to the neighborhood um, does not become dangerous, does not go beyond the level of service. Carolyn, do you want to speak to that at all? I am. No, I mean, I think you covered it. The, the um, Transportation and Parking Committee um, makes recommendations as well about based on data uh, and whether or not you know, there has to be study done first to determine what the issues are, if there are any issues. Um, and so you're right, though, the board doesn't have the jurisdiction just to say, okay, applicant, you need to install speed bumps, because um, I'm not sure that any evaluation of that has been conducted to this um, date. And so the process is as you spelled it out. I would encourage you to talk to your City Council, though, I mean, I'm sure with all the traffic pattern changes with the roundabouts and things that people are waiting to see what the new traffic patterns bring. Um, and I would imagine there's going to be some changes and speed mitigation uh, fixes around the city as we uh, change the overall traffic patterns. Um, I think there's also some weird kind of old paper streets that are in there where there's houses built in a public right away and things like that that could could also be addressed, but that's nothing the planning board can help you with, unfortunately. Talk to your city councilor. I think it's a good thing to, to speak up about. And just while we're on traffic, Carolyn, you mentioned a couple of times in the staff report the proximity of this development to the rail trail, but I don't think there's really any access, uh, an official access to the rail trail um, from this neighborhood. Correct. Other than, right? They have to right, go just down. along the street and yeah, but there is a requirement for, um, as with the previous application, you know, for traffic mitigation for increased um, um, trips that are generated by a project. So every new project proponent needs to address their incremental impact. Um, and so as in stipulated in the zoning, because there are five additional units, there's a formula for that, unless the applicant's proposing you know, some offsite physical, um, you know, improvements um, to that value. And it's based on the total number of new units. Thank you. And just real quickly on uh, Ms. Sulman's uh, comments and concerns about affordable housing. You know, we, we can't answer all of that tonight, but Northampton doesn't have inclusionary zoning at this point. Whereas uh, if a developer comes into town um, within certain limits and ceilings, they do not have to propose affordable housing along with their market rate housing. That's done solely upon 
the volunteer efforts of a developer, especially at this level. Um, there has been a lot of affordable housing, um, let's say advances um, within the city, especially on Pleasant Street and other areas. Um, and there are more in the works. But in terms of um, a private developer with a small development, there's nothing in our books to say that 25% of those units need to be at any kind of affordable rate. But let's turn I, back I, I guess I'd like I, I guess I'd like to comment on that. I mean, I I think that first of all, I would applaud the, the this this project. I think having um, five units that sort of allow for families to live uh, within a fairly actually small footprint um, is is actually a very good thing um, and is the type of zoning that we we should be uh, champ championing. Um, and then in terms of uh, in terms of affordability, you know small developers are constrained by the costs of materials. And the materials are very expensive. And the notion that somehow uh, Todd can somehow wave a wand and lower the cost of materials, I'm sure if he could do that, he would lower the cost of his of his rent of his rentals, but he can't do that. So I think asking him to do that is um, unfair uh, and not realistic. And I also like to point out that if you chose, anyone can sell their pro their, their personal property for, for any amount they want to sell it for. So if anyone is really worried about the cost of housing and you want to lower the cost of your housing, then sell it for, sell it lower than what the market bears and, and you have helped help the situation. One of the, if I might comment, one of the, one of the reasons to to offer this type of product is to offer a lower entry barrier into the area. So because they are small, although they will be market rate, it certainly would be less than many or most of the new homes being built in Northampton. Thank you. Go back to Ms. Solman. You have another comment? Um, oh, yes, thank you. I had two questions. One, what was exactly the height of the building? Did you say they were comparable to the building that's adjacent to it? I believe they said it's approximately five feet taller than the other abutter, Bob and Heather. So, so the way that building height is, is measured is you measure to the midpoint of a gable roof. That's a pretty standard practice. And per the drawings that were shared, the midpoint of the gable roof is 33 feet. The height limit in this neighborhood, uh, in this zoning district, is 35 feet. So presumably, anybody in the neighborhood could tear down their Cape house and build a house of similar height without even coming to planning board. All right. Another question, Ms. Solman, or? Well, I just want to respond to Ms. Taylor's um, comment that folks in the neighborhood should sell their homes, um, I guess. I said you could, I, you could. Yeah, I didn't and say then you should, where, I said you could. Where are you proposing that folks live? That's, that's, not, my, that's not my point. My point is, is asking a private developer to do that when you could choose to sell your house for whatever you want to is your project. I, I, I'm not implying that I'm asking a developer anything. I'm implying that our, our planning board should take into consideration what kind of city we want to create, whether we want to create an inclusive city or one that's unaffordable. But I do hear what you're saying that because there are no regulations requiring a certain percentage of new development to be affordable, that there's no mechanism to do that. So I guess what I'm asking for is impossible under current regulation and regulations would have to be changed to create a priority for affordable housing. And that currently is not a priority apparently in the city of Northampton. I think well, I uh, housing I'm, affordability I'm is one of the issues that we're dealing with as a country and honestly, as a civilization. Um, 
I think you'll find that the places with the highest amount of uh, areas that have uh, what we call inclusionary zoning uh, mandates to provide affordable housing are the cities that have the worst uh, affordable housing crises in the country. So there's a long debate about cause and effect to have there, but I don't think we're going to solve it in this uh, <laughs> meeting. And we certainly don't have the, the, the authority to the mandate it anyway, as you stated. So. George, I don't know if it or if the board wants me to um, sort of review for the public who hasn't participated in a lot of the conversations the planning board has had over the last nine months and year and even beyond that about the different types of housing and the attainable housing um, efforts as well as the affordable housing um, definitions. I'd be happy to you know speak to that if you'd like. Carolyn, maybe you could point them to where that is on the website instead of taking up time in this meeting for that. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, or anybody can contact me offline to find out the um, rules and regulations that the board and the city council has adopted in, in the effort to try to create a whole panoply of types of housing to, to fit in different, um, for different market needs. So it's not that individual, each individual project needs to meet a certain target, but it's really looking at the bigger picture for the entire city. Thank you. Okie doke, we'll go back one more time, the last time to uh, Victoria Monroe and Geraldine out in Oregon, because we do have other items on the agenda. We have more questions for the applicants, so we need to keep this moving. Victoria. Mine is really quick. Um, my husband just phoned in because he had a question as well, which I totally didn't think about, but we have solar panels, and I am worried about the angle of the houses if they're that tall that they're impacting our solar panels. Um, so I would really request that somebody work with us and make sure that that's not happening. Mr. Salora, Mr. Carney, could you speak to that? I think the angle of the building, uh, is, so of course we've been discussing how this uh, property is located in a low point in the neighborhood, so that it will be beneficial to you. Um, as well as a building that is 35 feet in height will not impact solar panels because the angles that solar panels need are more uh, overhead and you'll be looking at it at an angle of about 15 degrees from sun from the uh, horizon to the top of this building and you're not going to get light because it will be blocked by other trees in the neighborhood. Yeah, just considering the any trees that you're planting as well, especially along that back row, like we were talking about. Yeah, I mean, the big white spruce as proposed. Thank you. All right, Geraldine, 2086. Hi there, I just, I just, when Victoria was talking about that um, back hedgerow there and the tree, are those circles supposed to be trees that are going there? or just bushes? They're, they're supposed to be beech trees and white spruce. That's a, that's a lot of trees for that area. That's a lot of trees and we've got established maples. The house next door to me to the right of me is the Samaloas that have been there since the 60s. Yeah. And um, they've got a, a, some maple trees there as well. And I don't know about the roots, but Victoria, you have, you talked about, somebody talked about taking out the Arbor Vitae I don't know if you're thinking of doing that in mine or Victoria has hedgerows, but I, I, that's a consideration. My father started those from twigs and they grew into a hedgerow. So um, they're um, precious to me. So I, I needed to clarify that. Thank you. And, and I think Geraldine, we're, we're moving towards asking the applicant to go back and discuss the planting plan with our tree warden to make sure that the species okay. well. are suitable both in kind of their, their, the nature of their height and width and also how they impact the neighbor. So I think they'll be coming back yeah. with a revised look at those. Okay. So is it, is a five building plant, is the five, five spaces a um, set in stone kind of thing or is that um, open to discussion and lessening the amount of housing there in that number 29 Sherman, like um, Bob said? That is that was my other question. That is what the applicant has proposed. Three, three okay. buildings gotcha. comprising five units. So yeah, at this okay. Point in time, so it's a proposal. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 
Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for calling in. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm glad I could. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I have another Zoom okay. caller. <laughs> other Sorry. questions Go from ahead. the planning board or public who hasn't spoken yet. So, I'm a little concerned. I'm not quite sure which part of the design of the design standards this falls under. But uh, it was kind of identified in the application as sort of it related to the sort of asking for leniency on the on the entrances facing the street, and noting that the for the front unit uh, they changed the what looks like a book plan, you know, pattern book plan uh, to, to just rotate that entrance to face the street per the zoning ordinance, which I guess is a good thing. My worry is that this is clearly a. Um, I mean, this is a, 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 a townhouse plan that is clearly meant to be at like the end of the row on the kind of a side street. It's not a, it's not a design for a house that is meant to be facing a street. Um, again, I'm struggling to understand exactly how that falls under our purview. Cause you know, like, like we talk about all the time, like anyone with a single family house can put a weird window in their house and there's no review, you know? So, uh, I, I do worry though, that this is not creating a particularly pedestrian friendly experience on Sherman, uh, not because of the bulk necessarily, uh, which I think could be worked out. It's really, there's a lot of blank walls. There's a couple of these townhouses that like, you're gonna be seeing a lot of sidewall uh, from different angles. And uh, I understand the urge to do an economical project um, that can be sold you know, I know what things cost these days and what lumber costs, et cetera. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, did you look at different options? Uh, did you look at options? I, and I, I also appreciate that, that the garage doors are on the side of the building, not the, you know, not the front, but uh, at least in the front units, but also, you know, did you look at a layout where you could maybe put those garage doors on the back? You know, there's plenty of designs for rear loading townhouses uh, that give a little more street presence, a little friendlier. Um, in, in what is a very pedestrian scale neighborhood currently. I, I'm sort of taken back at, at the comments about the aesthetic because we spent a lot of time and effort to make these into something that looks pleasing to the eye. And this is not sort of run of the mill. Uh, these aren't run of the mill structures. The, the reason for less windows on the, on the gable ends of these is for the proximity from one building to the other and what would be required to have a fire rated window, which is just, yeah, astrono astronomically expensive and literally impossible. So the buildings, because of the one building to another, the proximity from, from one to the other, the wall, the sidewall, those buildings are fire rated uh, and they have to comply with a, a fire rating code. Um, so I'm mostly asking, sorry, I'm mostly asking about the, I guess it's on drawing one, the left side elevation, which is the street facing elevation of the southernmost unit. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, I mean, again, it, it, it comes down to, uh, again, Carolyn, can you chime in? I don't know where this falls. But the design standard. Open to change on that. I mean, and we spent a fair amount of time to get to that. But if that, you know, people have suggestions, I, I'm, I'm open to it. I agree with you, David, too. It looks a little awkward there, even with the porch, um, but then the big blank wall. Um, and I realize it's a garage behind there, but if they could do something to that, I think it would help that um, sidewalk appeal. Carolyn, I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? No, I was, no, not at all. I was just gonna respond to um, David's comment that, um, you know, there was back and forth between um, myself and the applicant about how to meet that standard. Um, I think the intention is really to have the full front of a um, structure facing the street. The way it's written is the front door has to face the street and this is the way the applicant chosen to do that. There's been a lot of discussion about, I mean, I think the, um, it certainly meets the letter of the ordinance, probably not the intention. Would you be, would you be open to extending that entry, the covered entry into like a full porch across that? I know it's a garage behind there, so you can't really put windows and stuff, but could you, I mean, do something like that that would be something more like a, you know, a friendly gesture towards the neighborhood? 
we we absolutely could put windows so and i would be okay with that we we, we could probably you know not that a two by two square window that looks that's on the upper part of that blank wall that looks in above a car so we're not looking at it at the side of a car but yeah we, we could also extend the porch i i'm i'm fine with that While we're on the uh, driveway or the, the exterior of the home, there was a, um, a concern, I guess, uh, by the planning office and the DPW about the width of the driveway being 18 feet rather than 15. Um, will, do you have uh, any objection to moving that back to 15 feet? So let's, Chris, can you? Um, yeah. Um, I think 18 feet will allow for two cars to pass by each other. It would be tight. There would be nine foot drive aisles, but because of the amount of um, residents in here and morning and night, there could be traffic conflicts coming in and out. Uh, I did speak with Carolyn. I think 15 to 18 feet might be acceptable uh, based on your zoning regulations. And so we're at the higher edge of uh, the top edge of that at 18 feet of width. And uh, that's the width we're requesting at this point. Yeah, I wasn't clear on why 18 feet wasn't a good number. Um, it's just, it's wider than a typical driveway. The, the, as people are pulling in and out, it's not, it's not like a road. You can see um, people who are wanting to enter the site while you're pulling out. So I don't think there would be a huge conflict point. It's really more about the amount of asphalt right there in that one area and to the extent that it could be narrowed and additional landscaping to sort of mask some of that asphalt is, is really the, the point. But the planning board, I think DPW's comment was more that the planning board has to approve that width as part of which you would as any kind of plan that you're approving um, because 15 feet is the maximum unless you approve otherwise. Could, could we do something like a, I have no idea of the cost of this at all, but could you do something with a, a 15 foot and, and then some sort of um, like a, a brick, a brick uh, uh, sort of walk, walkway that's at, at the road level so that people can pass? There's no, there's no sidewalks at this on this street. I, I I understand that. I was just trying to make it so that uh, you don't have 18 feet worth of asphalt. Yeah. Having it at 15 feet will in, unconsciously make your tenants, the homeowners slow down when they're coming in or leaving the uh, spot too. Um, and I think, certainly think there's enough room there for two cars to pass each other. Um, I certainly don't feel at this point there's enough reason to kind of go past those um, uh, maximum requirements that we have. Um, speaking of the extra um, pavement though, I wonder Mr. Carney, if you could just walk through real quickly the open space chart um, for us, because I'm a little confused on how much. Um, I know we're taking down a very big building with a large impervious surface, but I wonder what it's like in the new construction. So we can look at the zoning table uh, for the open space calculations that were submitted. Uh, and open space, um, we're proposing 68% of the site as open space with a 40% requirement. So we're back to something where the planning board has struggled before, kind of our visuals of the plot plan of the new construction. It doesn't appear that 70% of this finished product is open space um, to my visual eye. Um, I can't of course, go to this site and walk it now. Um, but you have a driveway. What is the uh, what is the materials of the uh, 
parking area and driveway in front of the units? Yeah, so they're all bituminous concrete. And so the original iteration of this plan, we had parking spaces provided along this east uh, side of the parking area. And this drive aisle was 24 feet in width. Uh, that was deemed to be too large. And these parking spaces to the right were omitted. And this driveway was shrunk down to 18 feet as recommended. Um, as far as the calculation for open space, we, we use AutoCAD and follow your definitions for open space from your zoning bylaws. I, they, it's an accurate number at 68 percent. Thank you. And the retention oh, visually is deceiving. Visually deceiving. Okay. I agree. Okay. Other questions from the board? But, sorry, just to be clear, the driveway is not included in the open space part of that calculation. I can pull up your regulations, but it was calculated based exactly from your definition of open space in your zoning bylaws. Okay, just be just answer the question. Is the driveway part of the open space or part of the built space? I will look that up and determine okay. what the definition Thanks. of your zone. Well, that's the definition. I don't I don't I know what the definition is. I'm saying I think we need to be clear that you're actually showing us what the right areas are. I mean, usually sometimes we see like the dress, this driveway is 500 square feet, the house is 1400 square, whatever, you know, like just break it down a little bit. Uh, we can show detailed calculations for open space. I, I mean, I can open up AutoCAD. It would take a couple minutes, but we could we could look at it in AutoCAD and come up with. Oh, all I appreciate certain. that offer, but um, we'll we'll look at it further. Carolyn, I don't know if you have any suggestions. Um, you're still above, certainly below the minimum, above the minimum for what's expected in this um, district. Um, we just have, as a course of action, been looking at these lately because they have been visually deceiving and we need to get a better uh, handle on how these are calculated okay. yeah, i'm not sure sidewalks are included i think there's some some omissions to what open space is it's not a straightforward definition other questions from board members i would just say in any event it does visually look like they're meeting the 40 percent threshold so i don't know exactly if they're at 68 or whatever above that but i think they're meeting the threshold so i'm not sure we need to see more numbers but it does seem like this is a question that's coming up more and more frequently so yeah carolyn i don't know if there's a way we can ask applicants to be prepared for that and have better numbers or better visuals that can help us because it is really hard to look at the plans and and make sense of the numbers that we see I'm not concerned about it in this case, but broadly, I think it would just ease the process for future applicants. Thank you. So if the board feels like they have enough information from the public and the applicant, um, we can move to close the public hearing or we could go through the conditions before we close the public hearing to make sure the applicant has a chance to discuss those. Do you wanna help us do that, Carolyn? Yeah, that would be great. Um, and as you talked um, a bit about um, issues uh, um, regarding um, trash removal and and landscaping, and so I think there's probably some other ones. There were some comments from DPW that the applicant um, went over a bit. Um, I think the um, the the issues that I've um, identified uh, prior to the hearing as well as the items that came up in the hearing relate to um, making sure there's adequate tree protection for those uh, beech trees that are being proposed to be saved. One of them will be um, you know, under the jurisdiction of the city tree warden anyway. The other one, again, beech trees are very sensitive to construction and so, um, we would recommend that the board add a condition that an arborist oversee um, air stating of the roots um, prior to any construction um, and that tree protection for that beech tree on the private property side, not the city tree, um, be conducted and that that be done before construction. Um, they're proposing um, infiltration, the, the bioretention basin has an operation and maintenance plan that's been submitted in the application. And so 
Um, the zoning ordinance requires that an operation and maintenance plan be recorded at the registry of uh, deeds for the future owners. So they owners buying in and understand what their maintenance responsibilities are. That um, sh they've identified that, but we need to make sure it's recorded at the registry before um, construction starts. Related to that, there was a comment in the hearing about um, salts and maybe and the applicant was proposing maybe that they would do snow storage um, in the um, over the easement area. However, um, that's really hard to enforce, especially long term. And so I think it may make sense more to understand if there are any maintenance responsibilities that are in addition to what's been identified that would address um, you know, uh, removal of, or different ways of maintaining the bioretention area if there are, or under the presumption that there would be salt supplied. Um, and so there may be a little bit more information that you want to get about that, as opposed to trying to impose a condition that no salts be used on the asphalt, because I think um, there's just no capacity to enforce that. Um, also the easement as offered by the applicant for the underground storm drain that's already there um, should be recorded in accordance with the city standards for easements um, prior to construction. Um, some of the detail sheets should uh, be cleaned up as discussed. I think there's, um, and this went to the applicant as well, um, the detail for tree uh, protection for the city tree should be modified to require um, a chain link fence. Um, and um, also, I'm um, sorry, I lost my place here. Uh, there was been discussion about alternative trees to beaches along the frontage. Uh, in the, yes, the trees that are there, um, appear to be healthy, they probably need to be pruned, but adding additional asphalt and, and tr um, ice and snow treatment um, could potentially have impacts and the city does not um, recommend uh, beach trees to be in an urban setting where um, that close to the street. So I did, there are, there's a list that the applicant can shoot from which the applicant can choose. It does not require a review by the tree warden because that's not their warden's jurisdiction to approve uh, private trees. Um, and then we talked about the um, $5,000 payment in lieu of traffic mitigation for the five units of the one-time payment. Um, talked about not having dumpsters on, on site and having garbage um, stored within the individual garages other than on pickup days. And can I, just, I don't can I just no. jump in. Sorry, there yeah. will be dumpsters during construction just for the neighbors. Right. This is regular refuse removal. <laughs> um, and I don't know where you all came down on the driveway narrowing. Um, we didn't talk about lighting, exterior lighting, but um, probably want to make sure uh, discussion about the maximum um, color temperature. Typically, you've required no more than 3,000K. Um, and then there was one other issue, oh, about the porch. I don't know if you want to see the drawings of an extended porch along the front, or if um, you just want to put a condition that the porch uh, be extended along that front unit, unit number one. I'd be happy with that, just, just that condition, just a porch to cover the blank wall on that unit. Okay. I'd, I'd, I'd also be amenable to ask to uh, continue the hearing for a couple of weeks and ask the applicant to come back with some more definitive um, plans and some of those revised drawings. I think that would be helpful moving forward for us rather than trying to condition all of these. Um, I don't I know every construction project wants to continue moving forward. It's a little bit more expensive to revise drawings, but I think the list that Carolyn gave us was uh, quite robust. Um, and I, I, I certainly want to have some more information about the utility lines and how that is going to be handled, um, about a new pole location, perhaps an alternative to the water, um, whether we're going with gas, 
And that would be helpful also to be seen on plan. I would also add, uh, this is going to be uh, split systems. Is that what we heard, right? Split yeah, system. Mini, yep, heat pump. Yes, mini right. split. Right, so just there's a number of out, your outdoor side units that have to be located somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you have plenty of nooks and crannies in your design to sort of shield those. So I don't think it's a big issue, but I think you might as well show those. Yep, those are becoming more and more prevalent in our society for sure. Yeah, and they, uh, they're unobtrusive, but obtrusive. So, um, Todd, would you like to request a continuation to the next meeting? It sounds like we should do that, yes. I think all, all the items are pretty clear with, uh, with the exception of the arborvites on the northern hedgerow. I think one abutter had hoped they would be removed and one abutter had hoped they would be saved because they were planted from twigs. Uh, we don't have contact information from them. So I think we're going to lean on the board to provide a recommendation for those arborvites. I, I would say you can only remove the arborvitae that are on your property. They are, yeah. Um, hi, you have contact information for me. I'm a owner of the property and I'm listed and um, I sent an email to see Mitch. Um, I can think that's the lady that's been speaking. So um, my email is available as well. Thank you. That's at 30 Coolidge with the Arbor It just seems like In the abutters have different opinions and it's going to be a difficult so process. I was at the site recently, and even though I'm not a certified arborist, I agree with the first abutter that they're, they're pretty old. There's quite a bit of overcrowding. There's quite a bit of dead, dead limbs and foliage there. Um, I think if they don't, you know, I think a new, new arborvita would certainly help uh, the tenants who are going to be there in the future, and also the future abutters in uh, Miss Monroe's house. So. From this one board member, I would suggest that they would be removed and replanted with new healthy arborvita. Could we request existing site photos at the boundaries? It might help clarify for everybody what we're talking about. Pictures of the um, arborvitae? Sorry. I'm sorry. So you I'm haven't really um, struggling meeting. with the phone. I don't understand what you're saying about you're just going to cut down my arborvitaes on my property, sir, on 30 oh, Coolidge. Is that no, what you're trying to say? No, Geraldine. Carolyn, can you mute them? Okay. As I understand it, the arborvitaes in question are on the new owner's property. They're part of the, old, the, the current property we're talking about. They're not on your property. Some of them may extend into the abutter's property, but the... The plants themselves are owned by Mr. Salora at this point. Um, I'm going to just interrupt and say, no, those Arborvitae are mine and they're on 30 Coolidge Avenue, just so you know. Well then, thanks for the correction. Uh, I, I'm not understanding. So um, I think there's a there's um, there are issues that obviously need to be worked out. You're, you have one hearing on October 28th. Um, so you have, other than that, you have time on the agenda to take um, this item up. Um, I would recommend that it, you put it at seven o'clock, even though the other hearing was um, scheduled for seven and that this just go above that because there's some very distinct items that you know you can, um, that the applicant can come back and address, including, um, I mean, I think this property was, the, the survey has um, uh, been submitted for this property. So I think the property line should be fairly clear, although the applicant might wanna walk the boundary with the abutters to um, show the property lines and clarify any concern about issues about the ownership of, of the vegetation that's currently there. So. I think two weeks probably gives them enough time to do that, but they can let you know if that's not enough time for sure. Um, and then otherwise it would be November 18th. Okay. I, just, I believe we could get it all done within those two weeks. Right, is there a motion to continue this public hearing 
until October 28th at seven o'clock. So moved. Second. All right, we'll go to a vote. That means for the public here, you'll have another chance to speak during the public hearing on October 28th. If new information comes up that you want to discuss. Um, so uh, the motion has been made. Is there any discussion on the continuation? All right, so we'll go to a voice vote um, on the continuation to October 28th. Mr. Taylor. Yes. David. Yep. Dana. Yes. And Corinne. Yes. Chris. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Krista. Yes. And the chair says yes also, so it's unanimous. Thank you folks for your time, applicants, your butters, planning board Thank members. Thank you all for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you very much for your work and reference. I'm gonna suggest that we have a two minute break since I've been sitting here for two hours. I need to move certain parts of my body around. Um, Can we take a vote on that, George? I don't think so. I think he has jurisdiction. <laughs> it's 9.06 on my computer. I'll see you back here at 9.09.
couple of weeks ago, I went to a meeting of the Downtown Business Association and Carolyn did it hybrid. There was a face-to-face -face meeting. I think Jeff Squire was there. Um, that might be in our future. We'll see as the COVID numbers keep going down. Let's hope we'll get to meet face-to-face -face at some point. Carolyn, let us know when you're back and we'll kick things off. I'm back. We can go ahead. Righty. So thanks for the short interruption. Um, so we'll now at 912 open up a site plan special permit amendment by Sunwood Development Corp for to add four apartment units above garages at 95 Barrett Street, Northampton, Mass, map ID 24B-2. Um, so this is a special permit, an amendment. Um, is there a presentation by the applicant? Right here, yep. <laughs> Perfect, so Jeff Squire here from the Berkshire Design Group on behalf of Sunwood Builders and, and Shaw Perry, who I think is, is here tonight. Um, so just a, a quick preface, um, this, this isn't a project that I have been intimately involved with. I'm covering for another partner. Um, so if there's a couple of questions that I can't answer, um, I'll defer to uh, others on the line or, or Shawl and um, please bear with me. But um, hopefully this, I'll, I'll try to be brief and um, make this as, as quick as possible given the, given the time that, we, that we're at. So um, if I've got the ability to share, Great, um, thank you. So this project is at 95 uh, Barrett Street. Um, if the board recalls or just a little bit of history back in 2015, there was a special permit uh, granted for, um, for a project for 12, uh, four buildings. It was 12 new units. There was one renovated unit in the center of the site. Um, there were garages associated with the, with the project and other parking and, and sidewalks and a, a, a patio in the park and, and some other amenities. Um, so that was approved in 2015 by the board. Um, 2019, the project was largely complete. All the units had been occupied. Um, and so now uh, we are here before you for uh, requesting a permit amendment to essentially convert, um, and I'll see if I can go, uh, convert some of the garage units that were previously proposed in the north portion of the site to, um, to two-story um, apartment buildings, a combination of two-story apartment buildings and, and garages. Um, so the original site plan, um, I'll just zoom in a little bit, um, Particularly, this is really the focus of this amendment request is in this northern portion of the site. Um, uh, sorry, I'll just go back. So the original, the original plan that was approved uh, had four garage, uh, single story garage units um, in this building, four garages in this building with a recycling area for the units um, that were elsewhere on the, on the property. This amendment is requesting an, uh, uh, an adjustment of those uh, garages to, to be a two-story buildings with apartments and associated garages, essentially the same footprint. So um, just to bring the board up to speed as to where, where things are at, one of the things that we did do as part of this uh, request is, is start a, uh, a new site survey and an existing condition survey different from what was established in the, in the beginning of the um, of the project back in 2015. So this is an, a, a completely updated survey showing the buildings as they currently exist, utilities, um, you know, all of the various infrastructure that was installed as, as, um, as part of that 2015 permit. Um, the, the proposal now is to, um, as I said, is, is limited to the, oop, I'm sorry. Um, is limited to this northern portion of the site. So what you see in here is yellow is really limited to, is, is really the, the limits of what this project or this amendment request is limited to. 
So it entails these buildings in the back. There's an, an area um, in the central green that we're uh, proposing five additional parking spaces, a relocation of the recycling shed that was currently located at the end of this building. Um, but in terms of the overall project site, the, the limits are, are really defined, pretty defined um, by what you see here. Um, again, looking at the, um, the, the uh, zoning summary from what was originally, uh, originally approved to where we are now, um, the difference really deals with uh, open space. Um, we were at 60, let's see, 63%. Um, the current plan is now at 62%. Obviously the gross living floor area um, has gone up from um, almost 15,000 to um, 19,500 with the additional units. Um, and again, that's reflected in um, the gross living area. And then the, the parking requirements, we've, we've provided some additional parking, um, which we can talk about as we get further on into this, um, this presentation. Um, but again, really the, the impetus um, for this amendment is um, to, to modify the existing garage buildings, which are shown in this elevation. So these are the garages, the single story garages that were shown in the north portion of the site. Um, the proposal is to renovate them into um, uh, essentially with the same footprint into two story um, uh, a two-story structure consistent with what's elsewhere on site for an additional four uh, residential units, um, garages. There will be four garage bays that are maintained as, as parking areas. So this unit here, this one on this side, and then these two on, um, on the right side are all still gonna be maintained as garages. The central is being, uh, the central garage is being reserved as a storage area for these units. Um, and so, um, again, just looking at, oops, I'm sorry, looking at the floor plan for, um, what's being proposed where these garage footprints are, um, again, there's a garage owner storage, a garage, two additional garages on the lower floor. What was previously shown as garages in the current plan are now occupied by stair units and an entry, a bathroom, um, and office spaces on the ground floor. Uh, and then as you, um, nope, that may be the only floor plan I have. Yeah, so I'm sorry. So the remainder of the living units are on the second story. Um, I, I can pull those up. They are in the, the application package, but this was just representative of what was on the, the lower elevation, um, the lower floor elevation. So again, these, these really are, are only occupying or modifying the footprints of these garage units in the back. Um, there's a small area here that we're proposing for, uh, for additional parking. Um, we recognize that there is some permitting associated with the Conservation Commission that needs to be resolved that um, we certainly are, are in the process of going through. Uh, we have received a stormwater permit amendment um, uh, uh, approval as of today, I believe. There are some additional um, comments from DPW related to utilities. Uh, most of those, um, I'm happy to go through those, but I think most of those are relatively straightforward with respect to dimensions of parking stalls and, and some other ancillary information um, that we can certainly provide. Um, I don't see any of that being um, major, um, major issues to, um, to what's being proposed. Um, so again, it's, it's really limited to what you see here in, in yellow. Um, it's this Northern portion of the site where there's, um, currently garages in this recycle, um, uh, building, which will be re relocated to this location. Um, patio walks will be relocated. Everything will be, um, you know, pretty much proposed as, as is. Um, with the addition of a couple of, of, of additional units. So um, it's, a, it's been a very successful project. Um, and I think which is, which is the, the, the reason for proposing some additional units um, in a location where uh, we already have current development. So um, trying to keep it short and open it up to, to board comments or questions. Uh, 
um, uh, quick quick clarification: the the uh, application is for two for five units, two duplexes and a single unit. I I wasn't quite seeing that single unit. I saw the two duplexes with offices on the first ground floor. Where is the single unit? Um, and maybe Doug or, or Shaw, you might be able to clarify where that additional unit is. Um, yes, I, I can uh, jump in that. Uh, hi, Doug. So I, I work uh, with Jeff at Berkshire Design Group. Uh, the four units that are being proposed, uh, three of them, as my understanding, are, are three bedroom units, and one is a one bedroom unit. Uh, so of the um, there are four additional units that are proposed. There, there are five garage bays shown, but only four of them are associated with those units, and, and one is associated with a just a, a, a owner storage. Uh, and then additionally, the 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 recycling building, the recycling shed currently that exists, that part of the garage bay is going to be relocated in an independent uh, structure would be there in the uh, northwest corner uh, that Jeff had alluded to. Um, that I think is on the next page, Jeff, if you don't mind turning to the next yeah. uh, proposed so, plan. I think, I, think, I, I think George's question was, where, where, is, that, where is that fifth unit? Um, is it the recycling building? Is that the it? recycling building would be the fifth. I think, okay. I think uh, that's what you're referring, that's uh, that maybe what you're referring to. Uh, and so uh, the independent structure that's off uh, to the west side, that Jeff is marking there with his mouse uh, is a small, I think it's 165 square foot, um, three-sided kind of Adirondack style uh, recycling shed. Okay, thank but you. It, it's not a living unit, right? Correct, it's, it's, not, it's, it, it's not a habitable space. Other questions from the planning board members? I'm always good for a couple. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, uh, so one one question. I wasn't around with the original special permit, so forgive me. Um, it looks like that new recycling shed is in a, a, that wasn't a previous snow storage area, was it? Um, that's a good question. I'm not entirely certain whether that was or not. Um, it's certainly something we could confirm. Um, looking back at some of the old permit files, but I, I imagine we would be able to find sufficient snow storage elsewhere on the site if that small you know, location was. Okay, and could you uh, show me the, you have like a combined grading utility plan? Mm. Uh, yes. I just wanna zoom um, into those five parking spaces. Um, I know DPW had some comments about trees on top of utilities and uh, and light pole comment and light pole conflicts. Um, right. So I assume you can work those out. Yes. Um, but... Yeah. Exactly. I, I did review those comments this afternoon and um, started to look at those and recognize that there was, um, yeah, some ability to to move those around um, accordingly. But I just, I was just curious about the, the drainage there. Yeah. So I don't know whether you can see this plan now. Yeah, could you just zoom in right on those five yep. spaces? That's pretty good. So there's, there's, um, I can't really, so, oh, sorry. All, all the people's faces are blocking what I'm trying to look at here. So yeah. Uh, so there's an existing stone diaphragm drain that kind of goes around the gutter line. Right. Um, but you're cutting into that now with these parking spaces. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious kind of what that is and, and what's going on with that drain line that's now under the asphalt and not yep. in the stone. So so that so that drain line is my my understanding is this stone diaphragm is a is a pretreatment element for for the stormwater, and so it's a it's an at surface um, a, 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 you know at at grade elevation with a parking lot uh, drip strip with some catch basins in there to collect the 
you know, the, the, the additional flow that, that may collect in that drip strip, um, which is what, what these are, you know, there's, there's one here, um, there's a couple, uh, there's a couple of those further down the site. So interrupting this uh, drip strip doesn't affect the drainage necessarily at all. The drainage is all going to the same location. Um, this is all below grade um, as with the remainder of the, you know, the drainage system effectively. So um, it shouldn't affect, um, you know, it shouldn't impact the parking at all. The drainage has been designed to, to be directed toward these gravel strips and these catch basin areas. Um, so that the pretreatment and the flow of that water should be all, um, you know, all, all contained very much the same way it was originally. And Jeff, just if I may, sorry, go ahead, Chris. Sure, I was just gonna say, so you might not be getting the, the pretreatment benefit for those new parking spaces though, because it seems like it just goes right into the catch basin pretty quick. And it, yeah, and I, I honestly don't know all the specifics of it. I do know that, um, you know, the, the Doug McDonald did issue, uh, you know, a, a, a approval of the permit, um, the stormwater permit. So, um, you know, I wish I had some more specifics to you and maybe Doug can answer, but I, I know that that was reviewed and um, examined in detail, so. Okay, I'll put my faith in Doug, thank you. Sure. <laughs> uh, I, I can't speak to Doug McDonald's uh, comments in, in that particularly, I was only gonna add that uh, the piping in that area is being changed to a, a solid pipe. Right now it's a perforated pipe that's within the gravel area. So just in terms of, of, of the plumbing in that area, uh, that's being slightly changed. As to the engineering, I'm on the landscape architecture side of uh, the uh, project here, so uh, would defer that to Doug McDonald's comments. Okay, thanks. Sure. Can you show us the drive lane through, through the complex? Yes. Um... Oops. Sorry, my mouse is acting up tonight. So that's not the entire. So this this is the current condition. So the central drive lane that is that then gets divided by um, the central green area in the middle. So this circles around this two-way traffic, you know, uh, through this entire loop. I'm trying to lose it. So it won't, it's not conflicting with the new site of the recycling shed. No, so that, right. So the new recycling set, shed is in this location. The parking, uh, this patio area and walkway would get relocated uh, more central to the green to make way for those parking spaces, right? And then the new units would occupy the same footprint as the current garages. Thanks. I see on, on this plan here, um, the, uh, the, the wetland boundary 35 feet from that little brook is marked by very large stones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all across and to the back of the garages. Correct. Um, the existing buildings have large verandas or deck verandas, the large decks off the back. Are they going to be mimicked in the new construction? So the proposal, so the the lower floor needs egress by by code and so um i'm trying to find the uh the best plan to share that shows those um revisions um so on the back of the units so on this elevation here the, the lower floor is required to have an egress um, per fire code. So the proposal, um, if everybody can see, oops, sorry, um, is on the back of those units where um, we need a walkway to the public sidewalk. They're proposing a cantilevered walk. And essentially this needs to be a, 
you know, three and a half foot wide walk that extends off that first floor elevation around to the public sidewalk. And so without disturbing anything, you know, you can see the existing grade that falls away toward the wetlands off to the right of this, of this page here. Um, but the idea is that we would have a cantilever deck um, and it really, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an emergency egress access um, off the back of those units. So in terms of decks or other, there, there are some, some decks or, or balconies on the second floor um, but on the first floor, all that's needed is, is that, that walkway to a public, uh, you know, to an accessible walkway. So that cantilever deck is being proposed and that lower level to avoid any impacts to, to additional wetlands. That answer your question, hopefully? Yes, thank you. And, and Carolyn, or perhaps the applicant knows when you will be going in front of the Conservation Commission with these plans? I don't have a specific date yet. I know we've um, we've been in um, been in touch with the Conservation Commission to, to to talk about you know potential agenda dates and um, you know the information required. But I don't have I don't know if we have a specific date yet. I don't think it's been filed yet. Right. Um, I, I did have a question about that, Jeff. Are those doors sure. in the rear required for code? I my understanding is that they're required for code. Yes. I think that's going to be an issue with the Conservation Commission, but you'll have to work that out with them. Sure. Yeah, my understanding is a code requirement for for fire safety, but um, which is which is what prompted the the cantilevered. Um, you know, emergency access, but we can certainly work that out with conservation. Because I think it'll lend itself to become a very attractive place to put out <clears throat> a little picnic table, even though there's slopage there and to kind of have the living space or the, the uh, COVID outdoor space and roach into that conservation area. Um, those yeah, and I guess the only thing I would say, George, just to add to that is that given where it is, um, and the relatively narrow width of these of, of this walkway, you know, it is really only three and a half feet, so it's relatively small. There's going to need to be a guardrail on this outside edge because of the drop. Um, so there's there's not going to be any direct access from these doors down to, um, you know, down to the wetland area. Um, just backing up, looking at these plans. Um, and even go further and look at these. So, you know, these these walkways will extend off the back of this to join up with these sidewalks, but there really won't be any direct access from those um, from those access ways down to down to the wetlands. Uh huh. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. In that. Uh... This is again probably part of the drainage calculations. Maybe Doug, in the I believe it's the northeast corner of that plane that you're looking at. There's a lot of leftover. Yep, right around there, and mm -hmm. a little bit toward. There's a lot of leftover um, construction barriers and wetland barriers, and there's a uh, what has become kind of a permanent runoff little stream from this property into the brook. So you might want to take a look at that and maybe the CONSCOM will when you file that. I, you know, I sure. think that we've heard from some of Butters about some of the drainage problems they're experiencing um, in land next to the, uh, next to the site. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that, some of this new little rivulet, this new little open drainage may be part of that situation. Sure. Other questions? All right, well then, hearing none from the board for the time being, let's open it up to public comment. Is there anyone out there in the audience who would like to speak in regards to this application? I would. It's Joe Leahy from 83 Barrett Street. Hi, Joe. Uh, a couple of things. I want to touch base on. The first one is the traffic. 
right now, and I, I don't know of any other neighborhood in the city of Northampton that has more than 500 rental units that empty out within 500 feet of each other. And based on the formula that was used by the applicant, that's 3,000 vehicle trips daily on, on, a, on a street that's very short, number one. Number two, at the top of the street, there's elementary school and kids walk back and forth to school. Uh, we had a situation a couple of weeks ago where my wife talked to the police department about the speed on Barrett Street and she remarked that the speed limit was 50, uh, 25 miles an hour. And the police officer said to her, man, nobody goes 25 miles an hour on Barrett Street. We've seen him go as many as 55 to 60 miles an hour up Barrett Street. Uh, this goes back to the city and their, their putting pressure on the neighborhood when they wanted to build that fire station. The mayor made a promise to the residents on Barrett Street that when there was not a fire emergency, no fire department apparatus would be on Barrett Street. Well, you know what? After that building was built, it took about 30 seconds for that rule to go out the window. We now have the fire trucks that speed down Barrett Street, 40, 45 miles an hour. And what's the gross vehicle weight of those vehicles? 26, 30,000 pounds. The kid runs in the street. How are they going to stop? Take this a step further. I included in the photos that I prepared for all you people, there's a sign right up the street in front of this project. It refers to condominiums. That's how this guy sold it originally. He had no intention of building condominiums. He never put one up for sale, immediately started renting them. And when he did that, he can't sell them now because no bank will provide a mortgage and a, and a condo project, quote unquote, a condo project that is rented out. They will not loan money. Um, I think the photos that I provided of my yard speak for themselves. Uh, and by the way, these photos are different years. Never did I think I was gonna need photos. But 2017, you see that, that the John Deere in the yard? That thing weighs over 700 pounds. It can't be pulled out. It sinks. I've got to get two or three guys over it. We have to pick it up and carry it out of the mud. That mud is not stopped. It continues. Each one of those photos shows the amount of water that's in my yard. And amazingly, this property has been in the family for over 40 years. We never had this problem prior to that project being done. I learned many years ago when I was on the Conservation Commission in Springfield, when you pave something, the water's got to go somewhere. Well, guess where it's gone? Our yard here. I would, re I would urge you, and I would, my big career building moment to deny this, enough is enough. You, you, uh, four, four units, doesn't sound like much. We're, we're talking about a neighborhood that's got, that's got more than 500 rental units. So I'd be more than happy to answer anybody's questions. Thank you, Joe. Is there anyone else from the public? Hello, Sarah. I see your hand raised. Could you tell us your address? Sorry, it took me a minute to unmute. Um, I, my name is Sarah Nolan. I live at 91 Barrett Street, so I'm in a butter as well. Um, uh, I, I, have a con I have the concern about the traffic as well, increased traffic. There is a lot of traffic, I agree, um, especially, you know, with school, there's, there's just constant traffic on this road. Um, but another concern I have, I know in the original special permit, there was uh, restrictions on the lighting out, out in the, so that it wouldn't be like leaching out of the complex. And I, the, from the second story of my house, the lights from the garage, I don't have a problem with the other lights, but the lights from the garage seem very bright and they come right into our second floor windows. And I'm concerned that if there's a second floor on the garage, second story, I, I would want to have very, um, have the lighting not be 
so bright, have it better directed down and not towards, you know, other properties. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Anyone else? <clears throat> so we probably in the first um, application back in 2015, I would think had a lighting plan, maybe not Carolyn, that we could yeah. refer back to. Um, yep. Because, you know, for board members, anytime a developer opens up a site plan approval, a site plan application for an amendment, you know, it's within our jurisdiction to look back and to ensure that all of those conditions have been met or will be met, or if there have been changes that really have impacted the neighborhood, we can address those before they move forward with the, the new plan. So, um, I, I don't think Sunwood um, proposed uh, or provided a lighting plan for this new uh, revisions. So perhaps we should ask them for that information. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can just speak to it real quickly. Um, there isn't any plan to um, revise the site lighting per se. Um, there will be some new, you know, obviously building mounted lights as part of the as part of the project. Um, and you can see those in the elevations here highlighted um, in these locations uh, on the on the back of the building um, here, and then um, on the front uh, facing the sort of the, the center of the site. These are all um, uh, a wall mount fixtures, uh, wall packs. And I was hoping that I had, um, I think I do have a file of that particular um, fixture. I may not have it right here with me. I but believe it, you're, you're supposed to put, give us a photometric plan as part of the application. Sure, yeah. And these are all building mounted lights. You know, they're full cutoff, um, dark side compliant. We can provide a a plan certainly, um, but these are these are these are minimal mi minimal uh, minimal light additions to to just provide uh, lighting at the doorways. So yeah, but we can certainly do that. I, I just want to address the traffic issue uh, as came up in our last hearing tonight. Um, I have a couple kids at Jackson Street, and I'm very aware of the intense traffic situation on 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 Barrett Street and on Jackson Street. Um, and I, I, I think it's outside of the purview of the planning board to put in speed bumps and things like that. Um, I think it's something the city should be addressing. And I think it's been especially bad over the past, uh, you know, during this COVID time when, when there were no school buses last year. So every parent was coming uh, to drop their kids off and pick them up and stuff. And, and uh, it's, it's been a tough uh, uh, situation. And I sympathize with all the neighbors. Um, so, but I, I, unfortunately, I don't think there's something we're gonna fix in this, in this uh, committee. And may have missed it in the application. Are these units intended to be rental units? Uh, Shaw, maybe you can best answer that, or Doug. I don't know. Um, I believe it's going to be consistent with the remainder of the of the units. I'm not even sure we're allowed to consider that as part of the application. Well, I think David, just as you referred to a previous um, comment about. Uh, uh, the previous application we had that there weren't enough rental units in the city. I was actually going to say that this adds to our mix of housing in the city by having rentals rather than condominiums. Um, but I'm not sure where the developer is going with these units. Shaw, you seem to be muted. Yeah. Hmm. I I can't I can't answer that question. So we'd have to defer that to Shaw. We could get back to you on that. Sorry, Shaw. I'm not sure why you might be seemingly muted. But, well, in terms yeah, of I, the uh, traffic too, you know, rental units. They we can't say whether these people have two cars. I think they projected them down at trips that would happen, and it's not going to increase right. the uh, serious traffic that they have on. Um, Barrett Street at this point at LOS. Right. 
we, we did, I mean, as part of the application, we did provide a, a traffic impact statement, um, which, which proposed um, or estimated an additional three trips, um, average daily trips um, with, it, with this project. Per unit. Per unit, right. Other questions from the board who's getting a little tired out there in Zoom land, I'm sure. Um, George, I could just um, speak to the light. There was a um, lighting plan approved, um, uh, of course, under the previous um, um, application. There could be a, certainly a review about whether the lights that were installed um, meet those or maybe something happened and they had to be replaced with something that was brighter, but um, uh, or potentially they're creating offsite glare and so shields might be required. Uh, so that's something that um, certainly makes sense to um, address because the photometric plan um, showed that there shouldn't, there wouldn't be any offsite spillover. So, just so, so where should, where should I believe her name was Sarah, uh, who was, who was the the neighbor? Where should she go to? If there's a, if she thinks that there's an issue, that she should, who should she talk to? Um, well, the building um, commissioner is the code enforcement officer. So if there's a concern about lighting and maybe the lighting's not meeting the standards that are approved, that would be the trigger for um, a request for that review. Um, but also, um, you know, probably we would, I saw Shaw Perry raise his hand. That's another place to go since these are rental units. So he is in, he's, um, you know, managing or having someone manage the site. So um, that would also be another location, uh, avenue to pursue. Great. Another uh, item that came up that was marked on the original plans that we don't think has taken an effect is that uh, there's supposed to be a number of plantings of arbavita along the perimeter of the complex. And mm -hmm. we think only about 50% of those were actually done and established. So we'd sure. like the developer to take a look at those, the current plans that are in effect and note where those additional plantings can be done. Right. <clears throat> yep. Um, in, in terms of Mr. Leahy and uh, the drainage issues he's having on his lawn, which is down slope from this project, um, <clears throat> I imagine that was part of the calculations that was done originally in the stormwater planning. Um, it looks to me like some barriers were done as a mitigation effort to control some of that. Um, right. But I would hope that the developer could also look at that again to see if there's something they can do to help maintain that runoff flow. Um, and it may not be sheet flow. I don't quite understand all the hydraulics. It may be ground table water that's been affected. Um, Sir? Uh Carolyn, as, as stated, it's the high water table and the amount of space that has been covered. The water's got to go somewhere. So like I said before, guess where it's coming? And I, you know, I, unfortunately, I'm not hearing the answers that are going to correct my problem. So, and, and that problem is a direct result of you folks or your predecessors voting to approve this project. Now you've seen what it's done, and now you're going to give him four more. Is he going to come back for another 12 down the road? When he originally built this, he wanted 13 units. Now he wants 17. When's it end? I would hope that the new stormwater plan and the improvements that they've recommended with the DPW 
is going to take a lot of the impact from these new units, whether it's going to encompass the other units and their um, flow off their roofs and the, the, their driveways, I'm not sure. Jeff, I don't know if you have any, I know you're new to the project, Jeff or Doug. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to jump in and just I'm trying to, yeah, avoid. Um, so all of the stormwater, um, let me see uh, if I can just pull up the right um, plan here. Um, all of the stormwater for this site is directed toward that internal island. So all the roof water, all the, the parking lot pavement, all of that, um, all of that runoff is directed toward, um, toward the center of the site. Um, if I can share real quickly just some of the pictures that Joe has shared. So this is, you know, this is obviously the previous pictures. The pool I think is located up here, but I think this picture indicates that the, you know, most of this land slopes to away from the the development that we're talking about is to the right of this image. So most of this grade is is um, directed toward this this fence line. Um, you know, most most of what you see here is as again along that outer fence line, which is on the other side of, of the project. Um, we didn't, you know, all of the, all of the stormwater for this site is directed toward this internal island. Um, that's where all the stormwater is. Um, the, again, the, the grade adjacent to this falls away in, in this direction to, to the east, um, to, to the wetlands and the resource areas in the back of the site. Um, so in terms of the stormwater that's collected for the project specifically, all that's all that's directed internal and and is managed, um, you know, in accordance with the with the stormwater regulations for the city and the state. Other issues. Um... Carolyn staff report that needs to be clarified. There's some DPW comments that I think Chris referred to before that they need more details. Um, and I think the applicant has said those are mostly straightforward and they'll be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, mostly cleaning up of the plan. Um, I think um, the, you guys have already talked about um, uh, the issues relative to, um, you know, planting and, and the timing of this might be um, you all, up to you all to decide about when the plantings from the previous plan should be installed if they're either, you know, happened before this project starts or concurrently or towards the end. Um, also just a revision of the plans to address, um, you know, um, details that were inaccurate on the plans and, and um, to address DPW requirements for um, sanitary clean outs. And, um, and then the, la the other piece is um, about adjusting the location of the trees so they're not conflicts with utilities. Um, and then um, the other issue that came up um, was the lighting from um, um, just the public comment. So is the board comfortable that those can be handled by conditions? Should we ask the applicant to continue the public hearing and come back with more information for us? It seems like there's a bunch of plantings that have to get done before. I mean, there's a bunch of things that didn't happen with the last development. I'm not sure why we would allow the first development to happen. I mean, the second development to happen until those things are, are met. So uh, can you just speak, uh, aside from those, the tree plantings, are there other things? I'm not aware of other things that haven't been addressed, I guess. Well, there's the tree plantings. It sounds like there's an issue with the lights, um, or at least in one place. Um, yeah, right. uh, and um, there's, it sounds like there's a little bit of runoff problems going on here. Well, I mean, I guess we've got a we've got an approved stormwater permit. Um, the lighting, I know. I mean, we can certainly 
address that. I, I and Shaw can certainly comment, but I know there was a there was a photometric plan that was submitted and approved that conformed to the standards. Um, my understanding is that there were the the bulbs and the the um, lighting that was actually installed was a little bit less than what was originally called for. So the lighting that that is there should be less than um, you know what was shown on the original plan. I can't speak to glare and some of those items from offsite because that's a little bit more challenging to to measure. But we could certainly revisit that. Um, I'm just I guess I'm not aware of any of, of, of any other major outstanding items aside from the plantings that we would need to um, revisit. So I just want to make sure that we've got a clear path ahead. Sounds like it, you should be able to resolve it very quickly then. Yeah. The DPW also requests any kind of uh, uh, revised snow storage plan in relation to these new parking spaces or am I confusing my application? Um, I think there's, um, for that, um, sorry, let me just go pull it up. I don't see one in their comment yeah. letter, but we yeah. can certainly provide a I think, plan. Yeah, I don't think that was um, part of the issue, um, and certainly with, um, I think that would have been flagged as part of the stormwater permit conditions. Okay, um, you know, hopefully this, this has been a great planning season. I would hope that I know probably all landscapers are pretty busy and I don't know whether there's 35 or 50 arborvitas in the region that you can buy now, but it would be great to get them in the ground. Um, while you're specking those out on the southern border with the abutter, there's a single family residence at the southern end and there's a row of 18 arborvita there at least four or five of them are dead. Um, it would be great if you could also replace those at this time. Sure. <clears throat> All right, so we have a, a list of items that will be addressed, some recommended conditions from Carolyn, planning of the trees before a building permit, the applicant needs to submit a revised plans to the Office of Planning and Sustainability, showing corrections to an accurate scale bar, sanitary clean-out detail, location of bituminous versus granite curbing, mm -hmm. and relocation of trees to ensure they are not planted underground, I mean not planted over the underground electric. Um, And uh, certainly we are appreciative of, are we putting money into the uh, uh, traffic mitigation fund? Yes. So that could be prior to certificate of occupancy. Any other items, planning board members that I missed? All right, if we have no more questions for the applicant or uh, the public has no more questions, um, is there a motion to uh, close the public hearing? I move we close the public hearing. Second. Seconded by Melissa. Thank you, David and Melissa. Any discussion on closing the public hearing? All right. Okay. So then, because it's Zoom, we'll go through a voice voice vote. Um, Sam. Yes. Uh, Jana. Yes. Chris. Yes. And David. Yep. And Melissa. Yep. Hello, Krista. Krista, 
Okay. Chris abstains at this point. Um, and the chair votes yes also. I think we have enough votes. So the motion to close the public hearing passes. All right, any last comments or clarifications from board members on this application? <clears throat> Again, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the pieces of infill. Um, it's close to a school system. It's close to public transportation. It's um, close to downtown shopping areas. It's walkable, it's rideable. Um, it adds, you know, um, market rate rental units. Um, there are impacts certainly to the streets, to the abutters, um, but hopefully they are outweighed by the positive impacts of this development. And this area does have huge amounts of water in the soil, in the ground. I mean, I have, I have a couple pieces of property over here, and it's, I mean, the, there's a a lot of water there. So Sam, Can I just if I understand you correctly, you're just commenting that there's a lot of water in the abutters yard. Well, I'm, I'm saying that that area has, you know, with the extreme amounts of rain that we've been getting, you know, the the two pieces of property that I own right over there, like I've had to install serious sump pumps in them because the, the water, I mean, there's like a class five river in that running, uh, running under that whole area. So, you know, I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying that, that this development hasn't caused a problem in, in the neighbor's yard, but I'm also saying that, that I, I know because I'm not abutting the, this 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 property, that there's a lot of water in in the ground, and that's just my personal my personal ex experience. Um, and I mean I, that's all it, uh, that's all it is. But I do think that it's worth noting that sometimes it's not it's not the fault of of a development; it's just an unfortunately nature. Thanks. All right. No other questions. Is there a motion on the application? I have a question. Sorry, I'm just tired and I just want to make sure I I know what the process is. So we don't need to do any conditioning around um, what happens at Conservation Commission because if they don't approve it, it's not going to happen anyway, correct? So that just, it's whatever their decision is. Yes, I'm seeing nods. Thank you. Good question though. I always think that unconsciously if the planning board approves it before conscom they may they may influence some of their decisions well planning board thinks it's okay we think it's okay but i guess on the flip side if they went to the planning board first and resolved some of these things we would also look favorably on the application it would have been nice in this situation because it's so close to that intermittent screen and stream and i think there is a real temptation for renters, for anyone to kind of move their laser activities outside of their house to the yard. And even though in the front of these apartments, there's a little communal space, all the other units have a private backyard space and these folks won't unless they create one gorilla wise. Um, but we'll leave that to the cons count. <laughs> all right, other questions? Is there a motion? Doug or Jeff, you want to make a motion? I was very tempted. <laughs> Move to approve the project uh, based uh, with all the caveats that we put forward. Does anyone want to listen? So a motion's been made to approve the project at four apartments above garages at 95 Barrett Street. Northampton. Yes. With the with. with the conditions we discussed, including uh, the revised plans, noting four items, um, and uh, planting of required trees along the border, 
ASAP, um, money put in, in lieu of, put into the mitigation fund. And anything else? Can I just ask for clarification about the the timing for the tree planting? Do you want that to be before they start construction on the apartment units or? Um, OK, yes, I just want to make sure I understand what your intention is. OK, is the applicant OK with that? The planning of the trees that should have been done in 2015 before you move forward on this project. So before you request the building permit. Thank you. Okay, so motion's been made. Is there a second? A second. Thanks, Melissa. All right, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, we'll, we'll take a vote. Um, and I'll start up top with Sam Taylor. Yes. All right, and Jana? Yes. And Chris? Yes. And David? Yes. Uh, Melissa? Yes. And Krista? Yes. All right, and the chair also votes yes to move forward to approve this, so it's unanimous. Well, thank you very much for your amendment. Thank you. Yep. Good luck with Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Yes. Yes. Thank you for your questions and your patience. Yeah. Have a good evening, everyone. I think planning board, we have to hang in there for a few more moments. Our friendly staff person has a couple of items. <laughs> um, I have two ANRs, but with two cat with a caveat for each one. I just realized that. Um, Neither of the a and R's um, have been submitted electronically. Um, one of them, uh, they submitted the applications, but the surveyor, in one case, the surveyor doesn't do electronics. So we don't have an electronic file. And so we have to create that file. Um, so I can show you on Google Earth the, the lot that's being created. Um, if that's not acceptable to you, I can certainly take an image of the paper copy that was submitted to our office. I just, I just uh, frankly forgot that we didn't have the electronic file. I just assumed I could present it on Zoom. And so I don't have an image of it. Um, the other one, the surveyor sent the wrong file, um, the wrong electronic file. It's some lot in Belcher Town. So that's not really helpful for you. I can also show you where that one is. That one is really just a, a um, it's not even creating a new lot. It's changing the boundary between two parcels. Um, they, and so um, it's not going to actually create anything new. The first one is creating a new lot. So e under either scenario, uh, you know, we could put them off to the next meeting or um, if you wanted to just um, look at where they are and um, make a determination that way, you're fine to do that. I, I would prefer to see the plan that I'm endorsing personally. Okay. It's just me. I feel a little squeamish that we endorsed a plan that didn't exist in the previous hearing, but I went uh, along with it, peer pressure. Uh, I want to know about the surveyor who can stay in business without using uh, CAD. <laughs> That's impressive. You, you still ask for Mylar? You can't. You can't just get them to send you a PDF. Um, we uh, we do. We ask for PDF and CAD and paper copy. Yeah, and paper copy. So we have paper. Yeah, the registry probably wants the Mylar, not the city. Right, the mylar goes to the registry. So. You want to open up the whole discussion about archive files at the planning <laughs> office and how we access them? They seem to be working now. So I think we've agreed to put off these two A and Rs until our next meeting, Carolyn. Okay. Hopefully you don't have a lot of extra work to do, but 
No, I, I mean, one of them, I assume I'll get the digital file any day now because I don't, they'll realize they sent me the Belcher Town one. Um, but the other one, I'll just take a picture of it and put it up on the screen. Um, sorry about that. And then, so actually, I don't have anything else. Great. I don't, I think we proved all our minutes last meeting. Um, so we're good to go. Thanks folks for hanging in there for another three hours serving your community. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. Seconded by David. Okay, Sam, how do you vote? Adjourn, okay, Jana? Yes. And Krista? Yes. And David? Yes. Chris? Yes. Hey, Melissa? Yes. George, and it's unanimous again. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Have a good one. Yep. Bye.